Let's get started. Hello, humans, and welcome to the real time microconference at the Linux Bombers 2021. So, <clears throat> before I start, we would like to say thanks, really thanks, for the Linux Bombers conference sponsors. We have Facebook as Diamond sponsor, we have IBM as Platinum sponsor, we have R in Microsoft as gold sponsors and Amazon AWS, Netflix, and Red Hat as silver sponsors. We also would like to say thanks for Collabora for the speaker's gift sponsor and VMware for the t-shirt. Uh, also Linux Foundation with the conference services always good to count on them. And so before I start, it's important to clarify that, uh, yes, this is a microconference. Yes, there will be a lot of discussions here, but let's try to keep a friendly uh, environment, an inviting environment. We will see talks here from people that, he, that are uh, old uh, figures in the the community, we have uh, talks from, from newcomers. Let's receive everybody very well and let's be kind. Nevertheless, there will be discussions. As long as they are technical, uh, it's good. Let's keep it as technical as possible. If you feel uncomfortable, please reach us, right? So, in order to keep the system running well, this is a big conference, please keep your microphone and camera muted when not uh, participating on the discussions. So if you want to make uh, a comment or ask a question, turn your camera on and wait the people ask you to, to, to talk or to express yourself, right? And uh, after you finish your topic, please uh, turn the camera on and let's keep the environment uh, running smoothly. So we would like to thank the LPC 2021 Planning Committee. It is a tough work having the organization. I'm working on the, the RTMC and the scheduler microconference. It's a lot, uh, already a lot of work. And for the entire conference, it's even, even more work. So thanks, David Woodhouse, Elena Zanoni, Kate Stewart, James Buffley, Christian Browner, Jonathan Corbett, and V. Leonard and our, our lover, Steven Russell. No, we are not in a break. So, not yet. So, we'll start with our first uh, topic from, from Sebastian. Sebastian, are you ready? I'm ready, yes. So, I, I think we can start now. Ah, and final request. Uh, we need to take notes of uh, the discussions here because it will be used later, right? For the people that could not attend and would like to, to read what we're discussing here. So please join us, take notes. Uh, I will do my best on taking notes, but I'm not a native speaker. You guys will see a lot of typos. It's just more work fixing them. So if you write well and would like help, please join us in this effort. And yes, uh, Sebastian, it's all yours now. I made Sebastian uh, present presenter, so you should have control, okay. Sebastian. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm maintaining the frame of TQ. Uh, my name is Sebastian Zivio, and I will try to share how we maintaining the queue right now, and what we intend to change or what might change uh, when we hit upstream completely. So right now we're handling everything in a single quilt queue. Um, using Git never worked out due to the workflow we usually have to follow. 
So basically what we do is on each new version, stable or completely new upstream release, um, we take the queue and we push it up patch by patch until it applies completely. And then we try to make sure it compiles, it works. And during the process, we try to um, address new issues that show up or react to reports based on the mailing list. And for every new release we make out there, we started around 3.8, 3.6, something in that area to import the complete queue into Git since people ask for it. So we did it. And we don't keep the patches around forever. We try to fix, uh, to fall back fixes into the original patch if this um, is the case. Like we have like one patch fixing issue and then we have to adjust it again. Um, then we retest from time to time the patches to see if the original issue that we had some time back still applies. And depending on the, on the patch that it handles, we either submit it uh, directly upstream and sometimes we rework the, the infrastructure more or less. Um, prominent example is for instance the software queue handling. While in the 3.2 area we started with um, one threaded interrupt per soft IQ per CPU. And in the end, we ended up with something very, very close to what Mainline is doing right now. So we basically got also the same problems, but the duct tape we had around soft IQ to make it work um, disappeared by a large number. Um, another example is log log, for instance. In the early days, we had recursive locking here, and it even worked cross CPU. But the thing that uh, reach mainline doesn't do either of that. It's only, uh, it, it cannot nest right now. And that's what's intended. And this is basically the, um, based on lessons learned, what we had in the RTQ, um, which acted more or less like a staging tree. So we could test drive the code and see how it works. And in the end, we were able to submit a solution that was well, something that we liked in the end. And then we use and go upstream tree by tree and try to land the patches there. So sometimes it's like one tree for a specific feature. Sometimes it's uh, 10 trees or even more, depending on how inversive it is. Um, now, I have no idea how the future workflow will be due to the unforeseen things in the future. But the obvious things are that the changes have to end up in the upstream tree of the re uh, relevant maintainer right away. And one thing I actually hope for is that the, since RT is mainline, then testing could also be done before the code of the other maintainers or contributors hits upstream. Because right now we usually see that something broke once we update RT to the, to the relevant kernel version and then try to, to fix the issue at hand. Um, a few things I saw in the recent months is that people try to avoid warnings that came up with RT or RT relevant code. So I hope in the long term that this doesn't happen like all the time and people try to understand what's going on and don't try just to work around the warning and keep working as is. Um, another thing I hope that comes with the future in the future is that people don't assume things that our team might want and might not want in terms of latency, in terms of um, code structures like making a raw spin lock every time uh, there is a warning or so and just try and talk to the RT developers first before making any radical decisions. Um, one example is for instance the, um, the commit I mentioned below is just one example I just came up by making the slides. Um, the thing is that um, 
with fraud interrupts and uh, a warning came up and people independently started to fix it like patch and device by device and then the gen the gpo maintainer actually came around and saw that it's actually the same pattern for each and every device and then he came around and asked the irq maintainers if this is the right approach and then thomas looked at it and was like well, not necessarily. We could fix it in the core infrastructure right away. And at that time, it was actually one fix that fixed several problems. The commit message has actually all the details because we had also other issues in the NAPI interface versus um, the H timer, which we were sitting on for years and we didn't know really how to tackle it. But this one change actually made a difference. Now, this is actually everything from my side so far. And I'm actually open for discussion right now. So let's start with a question. When, when the merge happens, right, the, the regular, let's say, no RT developers will start to have to deal with the restrictions that we have, like, for example, usage of logs and all those things. How, how do we plan to, to address these kind of situations, right? How, how can they know who to contact or how can we catch these problems earlier? Yeah, I guess my question, Sebastian, was going to be, do we consider RT to be a subsystem? Therefore, should we have entries in the maintainer's file? And is that, that's going to be the only way for people to say, who do I talk to? You know, I mean, I know to, to talk to you or Tom or somebody like that, but somebody who's new to the to the uh, community is, is going to be, huh? how do I? How do I get in contact with somebody? Because this RT kernel is freaking out on me. Well, it's the RT kernel. You can, it's easy to go for the RT maintainers. Um, Logtap has like the one warning for nested logs, which are exposed to non RT to RT problems. So that will be like one way to go. But other than that, it's actually always specific to the, well, to the subsystem in place that may need to interact with the RT part as well. So I guess I was just, go ahead, Steven. Yeah, I, I was just saying, um, one thing we might want to, um, uh, also Thomas has raised his hand as well, but Mike, oh, cool. one, thing, uh, one thing I want to ask or suggest is maybe we should need a way that if there's an error, like a locked up splat that's, you know, due to, you know, real time, the preempt RT locking order. We really need to have a way that really expresses who to talk to, because, a, you know, a driver writer gets this locked up splat, they won't understand it. So like, wait, I don't understand. Why can't I grab this spin lock with this other, this other spin lock? What's the rationale between the two spin locks? They may not understand that. And ha we need a way that if they do get maintainers, or maybe I don't know if there's a report who to report to. I guess we need some sort of methodology to report something to say if maybe we should imply that if you know you've had this bug, here's the people you need to contact that you should talk to for this problem. Because I I get I just got an email today from someone says I got this slack or I got this uh, crash, who do I talk to? And they have no idea. So I think we need some sort of methodology that if it's a real time problem or a splat locked up splat that we say this is a locked up this locked up splat is due to real time issues. Talk to these people to help you fix it, or email this mailing list. But we don't have anything like that right now, do we? Just no a, just a Linux RT users list, but that's actually much more generic. Thomas? Uh, so maybe another point. Even even before that, I was uh, thinking that we might 
uh, need more uh, automated CI to actually test. Uh, I mean, ideally, all the patches that are meant for uh, for upstream uh, to test them with the RT config uh, option enabled, because I guess most of the uh, developers don't really will still not care about RT. And then maybe we don't. Uh, I mean, we, are, we realize we have a problem. Uh, when it's already been met, potentially. So I was thinking, uh, I was actually wondering, I, I think you might already have something along the line that does uh, CI testing automatically and probably we, we can help or uh, how do you, do you actually think it's a good idea or something that is needed? Yes, this is generally needed. For my, what I know, my devil tree is tested by the K robot with the preempt RT config enabled. And I hope that the other bots pick it up as well once it's completely mainline. <clears throat> right, yeah. Uh, so maybe, I'm not sure, I mean, one option would be to enhance even that further. I mean, we also <laughs> test, uh, I think the ARC guys test the RT uh, releases on basically on Fedora uh, with the full RT on. So I think we just need to tell them to continue yeah. doing that after everything is met by using the RT enabled. Yes, this yeah. would definitely I help. This is a general problem. I mean, if you look at a lot of the SysBot reports, they get an RCU stall and you have no freaking clue why. I mean, this is often enough hard to identify where something comes from. But on the other hand, if you have run something with config preempt or t enabled or the one of the robots does that and then it's flats and then the developer comes along and says hey but if i disable preempt or t it's gone i mean uh, it's pretty obvious whom to talk to uh, so i'm not too worried about that i mean this is uh, we have the same problem versus rcu and 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 other and other thing other non-obvious uh, uh, things which have very very interesting limitations i mean the only thing we can do is actually add enough debug uh, in order to make it obvious where where stuff goes wrong and then usually people find find their way to talk to talk to the right to the right people or, or ask somebody uh, if it's either inside the company ask a senior person or um, ask some generic maintainer who might redirect them to the right place. So I don't think it's fundamentally different from uh, what we have uh, in general. And hey, Thomas. actually, I, I just real quick, I just want to say exactly that was one of my point is that this is not just a real preempt RT problem. This is the RCU problem. This is other subsystem or this is other problems with subsystems that affect the entire kernel not just you know if a driver goes bad you call that driver the scheduler is something off the scheduler you go to the scheduler uh maintainers if you have something like real time or rc rcu that you get these weird errors and you're like why is this a problem and not understand it people actually don't even know it's an rcu problem sometimes or okay splat talk to rt rcu people maybe we need some you know infrastructure that makes it a little bit more obvious or a way a reporting structure Real time has helped the Linux kernel in general so much throughout the years. Why is this any different? Why don't we create something that will make it easier to talk to the right people? Yeah, you could, if you know the right people, that's one thing. But if you don't know the right, right. people, there'll be a lot of bugs that just go un unreported. That's, you know, that's my complaint is that we're, we're sitting here preaching to the choir. Everybody here knows everybody else for the most part. It's the people that are going to be coming in later that I worry about. Um, w would it be worth creating a directory and documentation with just a couple of text files that say, if you encounter a problem running a, a preempt RT kernel, email this list? That's not enough. Uh, you need well, something that's more like a get maintainer script. You need a script. We need to start pushing a script, writing a script that reads a bug report and says, here's the likely people to go go talk to. Yeah, but I mean, Stephen, the... yeah, get maintainers is great, but I didn't even know about it until last week when you told me about it. What about adding, adding a line to this split when preemptor is enabled saying, please report these to 
the ART users mailing list. We yeah. could have it so it's in the splat that we actually have a report in the RCU, same thing, have a command say report this to this mailing list and like it should that. be a mailing list, not a person. Uh, yeah, one thing yeah. I also have to I don't want, is, my, yeah. I don't want my email address in the, uh, we can put GLX in your Tron. If there's somebody you really don't like, you can add their address. Yeah, the, I'll, I'll, I'll submit that. Badge. But remember, it's, does it, if preempt RT is not set, lock depth checks for locking errors without preempt RT being set. It will look for, you know, if you call raw spin lock and then spin lock right underneath it, I believe Peter created a, a lock depth incident where you'll get a lock depth splat. And preempt RT is not anywhere to be defined. This is correct, yes. Yeah, you have to Probably. enable it, which uh, triggers a lot of noise right now on the main line, on a non RT enabled kernel. That's a, a problem we have to think about what we do about that in the long run. But uh, coming back to the original problem, so you can do what you want. I mean, you look at locked up splats. I've just saw. Uh, Today in the morning, I just ran into, oh, I enabled RCU list uh, debugging, uh, proof RCU list, and then ran into four-year-old code, which is still uh, exposing the splats there because it's not annotating uh, the the call when it when it does it on the reader side, uh, on the writer side, or just using a regular list uh, operation there. So. I mean, people either ignore stuff or they work around it in the weirdest ways. That's that's a that's a matter of fact. And no matter what you do, documentation won't help, and random entries talk to X won't help either. I just know you were looking at me when you said work around things in the weirdest way. Well. Like I said, just because there's always going to be people like Clark that does the around a roundabout way, there are still people that right, like to that would fix it if they knew about it better. And I believe uh, it's always I, a good idea I, to I, have a way of letting people it, know. Right, slash star. Yeah. There's there's the tendency to make it work and run away. Uh, work in uh, parentheses. I, I actually don't see any of these being mutually exclusive. Um, no, I mean we can, we can add more information. That's that's not a that's not a problem. But um, it won't it won't prevent people from doing the wrong no. thing. That's that's it's a, really more it's really more in the in the matter of okay, you've done something crazy or you've tried something and it didn't work. And how do you go? How what's the right way for you to go fix it? Right. So this is something we should t bring up at our stable RT meeting to say, okay, who's going to set out action items? Who's going to write the documentation or fix the comments? Or probably, probably, yeah. yeah. We need an action item on this, at least some place to you know pass the buck to. Well, let's let's go ahead and bring it up at the next stable RT, and uh, you know we don't have to dump it all on one person because I know Stephen, who you're looking at. Um, but I mean, we can share the load there, and and you know, it, I mean, it's it's actually not going to be a bunch of stuff that goes directly into Stable RT. Going to be submitting up to to no, LP minimal. It won't be for Stable RT. It'll be actually focused towards upstream. But something that we right. could, as you know, because real time's at mainline now. Our state, our Stable RT meetings are going to have to switch gears a little bit. We're, yep. we're running out of work to do. Oh, I don't <laughs> see that happening. <laughs> Uh, one thing with regards to the CI, uh, one suggestion would be for us to, to provide a list of tests that people could add to, to their uh, CIs, because a lot of companies already have CIs in place. So uh, if they run the tests that we care about, that will help us. Right. The other thing is the combination of options. Um, I was just fiddling around trying to, to get uh, you know, doing a, a config that wasn't a, a monster Fedora or full up Debian config um, and turned on a few debugging options that I had never turned on and bada bing bada boom, there were all kinds of uh, uh, 
splats and complaints that came out of that. So when we start talking about these CI jobs, uh, it may be worth us uh, pushing towards saying, okay, let's try as many of the oddball options as we possibly can. Um, uh, what is that, fuzzing? Or I forget what the, uh, the term is for going through and trying all the combinations of config options. But we do need to, I think we do need to get more coverage in a lot of these uh, areas because we all have our own favorite set of configs we use and we kind of get stuck in those and uh, maybe missing some some valuable splats and uh, information about failures we didn't know about by not by not uh, stepping out and using a wider variety of uh, debugging configs anyway. Um, Clark, how yeah. many of the shows are you expecting to run uh, preempt RT turned on by default? Wow, I have no idea. Because I mean, we have an off we have an offering. I don't th is uh, is Oracle offering a, an RT uh, a kernel by default? I don't know. Uh, and um, Debian does. Debian ships Debian an extra does. kernel with the RT kernel. Actually, yes. Okay. So so. The, the and reason, I don't know if Fedora will or not. We, we probably need to talk to them about it. The, the reason I bring this up is if that config's not enabled, it's actually going to be very hard for you to try to get most of these companies to, to try preempt RT in their CI because that's not part of their, their standard process. Hey, I'll ask. If they don't want to do it, that's fine. We'll work, we'll work with what we can. Okay. There's also uh, the embedded crowd as well, who um, constitute an awful lot of drivers. Yep. Um, and are um, like some of them will definitely be interested in RT. Obviously, that's that's one of the big uh, use cases. You know, I gotta wonder if the only way we're gonna get any kind of CI and coverage on something like that is through virtualization, because trying to get the right kind of bare metal support for doing that could be just insane. But I agree with you that uh, what everybody's generally calling edge computing these days, or maybe not everybody, but a lot of people are calling it edge, um, are going to constitute a, a good chunk of our use case for uh, preempt RT. Um, yeah, it, I mean, if we get anywhere with, I, I know Daniel was working on getting uh, some basic RT testing into kernel CI. Uh, if we get anywhere with that, we can get a pretty good sense of how bad the situation is fairly quickly. Um, because we can get stuff run on a fairly wide selection of boards um, without too much trouble, um, which you I mean, we'll, we'll not be able to leave it running if it's too bad, but um, it will at least give us a sense of, how, of what the situation looks like. Yeah, so the situation there in the kernel CI or Lava testing, um, all pieces are now there. We basically just have to start running them on, on doing the normal builds or whatever that means. So uh, currently I'm just using a local Python script which generates the jobs and um, triggers the build. But um, this is obviously not the integration you have on kernel CI. So I, ideally, you have kernel CI builds which trigger the lava, build, um, lava testing. I think this is, this is the logical next step we have to do for, for that kind of testing. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and then we, uh, we can give it a run on, uh, if we get, get it integrated, give it a run on the kernel CI staging server and then see how practical it is to actually deploy it at this point. Yeah, I mean, there's, um, if I remember correctly, there's already the I mean, kind of prototype running for this, but I think we just have to roll it out for more configurations, for more boards. That's, I think this is, yeah, we have to, we have to talk. We have to talk to those guys. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 
is your is your lot of testing mainly functional testing, Daniel? Or are you trying uh, well, to get now what, the thing I've done is basically I've, I've um, enabled all the RT tests uh, which are there and have the scripts around and make the command line options uh, everything um, uh, like streamlined and now I started to play with workloads so you can basically the main test is running cycle tests with different workloads and one of those was just running for, for example stress ng um, I was playing a bit with that one um, and obviously you can start could have more workloads which might trigger something yeah biggest problem we've had with doing automated testing is uh at least on the server class boxes you have to do a lot of bios tuning to to make it perform properly because those biases tend to like to grab the system and not let go for a while um so it it, it becomes difficult for you to automate any kind of testing that checks performance to say, oh, look, we've had a performance regression uh, coming through. So most most of our automated testing is is uh, functional just just because, you know, is, is, yeah, did this work or didn't it? And we don't try and do the, uh, um, try and do some sort of uh, performance check to say, have we changed over time? Yeah, but even that would be a plus side if we do that, because um, when I run stress NG for the first time, like the phone tests, I, I run into uh, one of the allocation errors done in, in the scheduling path, for example. So if, I mean, that would be already a, a good, good thing forward, I guess. If we have this automated, so if new code is added that we have at least no regression in that part. And like with, with the embedded stuff, the firmware, I mean, you can get issues with firmwares, but they're less common at the minute. Yeah. yeah. Also, the embedded, embedded devices usually tend to have more simple firmwares or no firmware, which allows you to get more consistent results. But my experience is if you you have really to to know your specific hardware box, what, what the, the capabilities are. If you change small things, you get different performance values. So not yeah. sure if that works out. Yeah, I mean, I, that, that's what I was, partly what I was saying about um, running it across the entire fleet of boards, um, you know, and getting a sense of what the results look like and whether it's set, you know, what, what the best way to, look at enabling it is if it's um, a case of going through board by board and say and trying to figure out if it works or whether so we can just turn it on and then there's a few boards that uh need some care care and love to work yeah so what one thing i've, I've added to the, the testing environment is basically that you can upload the results from cycling test to for post processing something very simple and i was playing with the idea to um yeah to Bought it in the long run, and basically what OSTL da, did or does uh, already, but integrated into certain kernel CI Lava environment, so that we can basically use larger fleets of test equipment. But may, maybe some of these performance problems can be overcome by knowing the hardware that you're testing and knowing the expected results, right? Yeah. So if you say that, okay, on my board, it will not reach that, that 50 microseconds that I ate because I know that this board has some uh, hardware interference that I can measure using the tools like hardware not detected, right? So no, yeah. I'm aware of that, the, the tool could first uh, do a profiling of the system, set up the baseline and see how the baseline varies over the time. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the thing I'm doing. I a couple of hardwares I know exactly basically to the, the expected results and if, if if something goes wrong in updating something I, I know okay there's something strange happening right now and you need to build this kind of confidence for each hardware platform each box basically you can't really predict it for anything new yeah 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 it's, it's a per, per use case 
Yeah. And actually, as all this data is automatically generated, it, it would be important to have a way to automatically watch the result. So, yeah. okay, and the algorithm will say, okay, I know that in the past the values were these. Now I saw a variation. Why did it happen? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if the good thing about embedded stuff usually is not that expensive compared to big server infrastructure. I mean, you can you could run a fleet of them, which gives you also a bit more input data, because usually you have to run it more than like five minutes, right, to get get any interesting results. Sebastian, do you have comments, final thoughts in the last minutes? Anything you'd like to add? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, generally, the um, fleet testing sounds like a good idea. Also, broad testing in general. But also the part where you try to navigate the people to the right folks to talk to. Comments, people? Um, yeah, we still have like three minutes. So, anyone else has, has questions for Sebastian? Laura, you always have questions. Why are you looking at me, man? I don't know. <laughs> you, you are good on news, Mr. Perta. I'm all, I'm, I'm thinking we've uh, pretty much solved all the real time problems today, just in this first session. So sh we should all go get a beer now. No, no, there's my talk now. Oh, that's true. My talk, my right. talk otherwise. It's You're next. next, okay. All right. But yes, it, it, it's, it was a nice presentation. Thanks, uh, Sebastian. And it was a good discussion. And it's, it's nice to see this level of engagement of the community. That, that's what we expect on a, on a micro conference. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay, I will slowly start my, my topic. It starts in the next three minutes. So just connecting, connecting the things before I start to, to respect the schedule. So people that might join the right time. This, these tools can be used in this to, to collect data from people that doesn't know what to trace or where to start when when dealing with the problems with RT. Maybe like people that never used the, the, the RT that would like, that saw some bad numbers and would like to send a report of, okay, I saw the bad latency, that's the where to start. But I'll discuss about this later. And there will be more topics about Lava and you know, whatnot. Okay, I'll, I'll start two minutes early. Uh, so, yeah, I think, I guess people know me, I'm Daniel, I work for Red Hat, and the, and the talk here is about the tooling, new tooling for, for testing, the, the performance aspects of the print RT, and the name of the tool is RTLA. It's not uh, Los Angeles, it's Linux analysis, real-time Linux analysis. And before I start, I have to say that this is a, a super product of the topics I was presenting in last year's, like the RTSL that I presented last year. I, I got a proof of concept and took out some super products. It will return in the future, but these addresses, the, the problems that we have uh, nowadays, right? you know, on our daily world, RTSL will be in the future. So, yeah. Let's start, it's, it's the correct time now. So nowadays, we use a set of black box tools that mimics some kind of workload that we aim to use or, or to maximize the values on the print RT, right? So we have cyclic test for the, for the case of periodic tests that we try to mimic, and that's our more traditional uh, tool, right? But something that we have been 
I, I would not say ignored, but not paying as much attention as it needed. It is the case of uh, peace loop tests. You know, uh, we have a lot of customers, even before this story of uh, network function virtualization, many people on, on stock exchange, they use peace looping tests and they try to maximize the availability of the CPU for a single test, right? And then you have SysJitter and, and then Westlet that came to, to, to fill the void that SysJitter was, was leaving. So generally, we run these tools and see the values, right? And, but when, when some unexpected value happens, we need to, 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 to put our hands in the, in the dirt part of the work. And it generally involves uh, setting up a traces session manually, right? Uh, and, and this is not easy, not always easy, let's say. When we have uh, someone else operating the, the system for you, I've probably worked for years at Red Hat support and many times I had to instruct the, the, the customer how to run the test, how to collect the trace, right? And, and that involves a lot of back and forth of, of, of uh, communication. Uh, and it, it works, but it, it could be improved. And uh, mostly it uh, involves a lot of interpretation of, of data, right? Uh, let's say computing deltas between two events that we always do over and over again. And uh, when we don't have like a clear, clear, let's say at least a starting point, a lot of speculation goes on. And speculation is, is misleading because uh, let's see, in the next, next uh, you understand why. So uh, you never know when you run the test and you see a bad number, you never know if the problem you saw now is the same problem that you saw later. Let's say uh, one common thing that, that I see is uh, there is a problem that happens almost every year, right? Almost every month. Then you see a bad number and people start guessing now what happened. They do some change that has nothing to do with the original problem because you don't have an evidence of the, the, the regular problem. And, and then because the problem doesn't happen frequently, the, the speculation pointing to the misleading direction becomes a truth that it's not a truth. And that's especially uh, hard. Sorry. <laughs> and that is, is, is uh, especially hard when we start to have like very tight values, like when people are targeting tens of microseconds, right? But after all these years having to debug this kind of problems at Red Hat, you no, know, for, for the vast majority of people that's developing the RT, this, uh, this starting point is almost a mechanical thing, right? And so any mechanical thing should be uh, replaced by an automatic way to do things. So, and, and that is the, the root uh, of the OS, law, OS noise and timer lot tracers. Uh, these tracers are already landed in the kernel, right? Uh, and, and the idea here is that they, they do not, they are not only tracers, but they also dispatch a workload that is uh, uh, tied to the tracing. So, and in these two cases, the, the, the workload runs in kernel. And, and the, the motivation from this came from hardware lab detector. So US noise runs a piece loop in kernel and it reads the time in the loop and reports when the two reads of the time are, are higher than, than a threshold. So we had a noise. <clears throat> and we had timer lab. That is basically the, the, the same idea from a cyclic test, which is a periodic timer that's awakened in the future. And uh, here, uh, the, the, the timer lot, because it's in the kernel, it can also report the IRQ latency, not only the thread latency. And these tracers add a new set of trace points that automatize that mechanical thing that we usually do, like enabling uh, uh, IRQ entry and IRQ exit trace points, and then computing the delta. Enabling uh, sketch switch and computing delta between sketch switches of a, a thread, for example. And, and these trace points, they, they report the interference of the workload on the interference uh, made on the workload dispatched by the tracer. And the good thing is that the workload, because they are in the kernel, 
I can synchronize both the workload and the trace and use this to generate better information. I tried to do this first in, in the kernel in user space. We can discuss this that, but it didn't work because from user space I cannot automatically access the data in kernel. I always need to do some sort of <clears throat> system call, and this breaks my my the, the idea. So uh, ah, and and because it's possible to access this data, you can also instead of just reading the data between two time reads with the S noise, it can also report how many interference happen in this data. So just, just to show one example here, I'm, I'm getting to the point now. So this is the output from the OS noise tracer. Just enable it and it sends a report that looks pretty much as a, a, a benchmark tool, not a tracer, right? And gives some useful information, including like counters of interference. For example, this system here was showing hardware interference which could be detected, for example, by a uh, hardware lot detector. In this case, they are high because they are a virtual machine. Uh, and here is the tracing part where I enable the events and I can say, okay, here this thread found a threshold. Uh, and it say that there was an um, eight microseconds noise and it was caused by two interference. So I just need to go back and boom, boom. Okay, it was an IRQ from timer and a migration thread. So, and that is the value of these, these tracers. They give you numbers and also some precise and, and uh, already interpreted data that you could give to, to a developer. If you are not a RT developer, you can give to a developer. And, and that's a nice starting point. It's not the end of the journey. Then you could do other tracing, but it's a starting point. <clears throat> so here is the tool. Uh, the, the RTLA is an interface for these tracers. So uh, they, the tracers, they, will, they work nice as tracers, uh, but they could also be used as white box testing. So they could report the benchmark to values and uh, report a trace if an unexpected value uh, happened. And during uh, in, in, any, in any session, you can always have this enabled. So if you find like a higher uh, OS noise latency, you can capture that, that case and do a report of with, uh, okay, what, what caused it. The idea of RTLA is doing an intuitive interface because using tracer is not always easy if you're not a, a, a developer, right? It is easy, Steven, it is easy, I know, but it can be easier. Uh, and, and this tracer already have a nice set of configs and making it user available for users user is better, but there are things that are better just to do in user space, like setting priority of the workload, saving data to trace. And, and I will just show uh, a video of this, the demo of this tool. If the font is too small, I pasted the link of the demo in the, in the shared notes. So here I'm showing the, some options. So the RTLA has two, two modes, the top and the histogram. Here it's patched the OS noise in a top of view, which gives you a more interactive view of the summary of the report. And we also have the histogram and we have some, 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 some options like using things with priorities, setting the CPUs, like skipping zeros or lines with all zeros you just skip to make the output clear. And you can do all the tracers configuration from here. Uh, you see, then we have the, I think I'll do the timer lab now. This so is the Daniel, top. Go ahead, sorry. Um, so that, that demo that you were just showing uh, with the histogram mm -hmm. that skips zeros, that you just zip to the bottom and that said that the max latency you saw was 75 microseconds. Did I get that right? Uh, let me show here. Yeah. So you had yes, two hits. Yes. So it's a really quick way for you to be able to say, what's my max? But, yes. Which is what we're always trying to figure out. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Just going back to play. Okay, timer not top is it's the same idea, but it shows the RQ timer latency, the trend latency. 
And here also the histogram. I'm just reducing the number of CPUs because it would not fit on the screen. Wait a little bit. Boom. Both thread and IRT latency. The, I submitted the patch last week, but it already has main pages and things to make it use. But that, that was like using only as a benchmark and this is using the tool also to collect the trace to send it, for example, for developers. So here I'm setting, saying to trace and to save to LPC file. I say to stop the trace if a thread latency is higher than 30 microseconds and to get a stack trace of the, of the thread that was running when the IRT happened. Here the, the, the benchmark tool is, is showing the results. Uh, it's running a background workload. Here, here it's just running a kernel compilation in the background. And boom, the trace hit a stop. You can see here on the CPU 20, you already can see that there was a 30 there. And then I can just read the trace that was saved. <clears throat> so yes, it was the CPU 20. And uh, there is a stack trace of when the RQ happened. It's pointing me to a network stack, which is often the cause of problems and things that we look at and say, okay, here's the problem. But at the end, the noise added by the thread is just four microseconds. The vast majority of the noise in this case was the timer interrupt with 23 microseconds. Hmm. And actually, the thread saw this, but the IRQ didn't. The IRQ latest is just one, one microsecond. So the problem is, is is in the timer uh, IRQ, and that's obviously just the starting point, right? Now you can use other function of trace uh, to, to figure out the, the problem. Just, I, I just, I will raise the questions now in the discussion, just a second. Returning back to the presentation, stop sharing. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, the code is fresh. Uh, the timer lot, the noise noise tracers just landed on kernel on 5.14. And this tool, the following the conference driven development uh, cycle, uh, the RFC was sent to, to the mailing list uh, last Friday. The tool is written in C and it's mostly using libtracefs because the traces are on trace. And it's been, it's been quite good to use with TraceFS. It has good documentation. It's very easy to use, helping to automatize a lot of things. <clears throat> and, and although it's not using BPF, it would likely use soon. I, I did some experiments measuring the OS noise and few BPF, but then I found some, some limitations that probably will be overcome in the future, but uh, that, that lead me to do things in the this tracer refused the RTSL code, which was presented last year, but I had to postpone the, the trying RTSL, which is a more robust for the scheduling latency. It has like some, some academic background showing why that is the worst case and not just one case. And, uh, but these two tools are, are super products of that proof of concept. And the proof of concept is already giving us some, some results. And there are more tools in the pipeline. The rare RV interface will likely use the same code base. So that's a, a, your feedback on here to also be important for that part. And that's it, uh, discussion time. I have some requests, but we can discuss the, the tool as well. So you're gonna do a new paper on a different software uh, development methodology, conference-driven development? Oh yeah. <laughs> That, that works for open source. And of course, the obvious question is, why did you write it in C and not in Rust? Uh, I asked him that. <laughs> I, I wrote in C, I tried to work uh, first with UBPF. There is an EOS noise in the interwebs. It was nice, but at the end of the Derivating the work from the hardware lab detector was the, the most precise way to, to proceed. And that's why I wrote it in, in C. And, and lead trace of S is in C. It's, it, it's the tool that worked for me. But if in the future I have to use any other languages, I, I don't have problems. Uh, OK, Ahmed. OK. Turn on the camera. 
without the camera, I will just ask. So I saw the trace in your video and uh, I always had, and it was also clear that the user space part there, it was just, it was not decoded. And I always struggled actually with F trace regarding user space, tra uh, user space stack traces. And I just gave up and used perf, honestly. So is, is there uh, a way to solve this or the user space stack traces will still be undecoded? I think that there are two possible ways to answer this. One is these trace points are also available through perf. And if I can use perf and, and a, a C way to, to use the same methodology that perf use, I can do it too as well. So it's easy to 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 circumvent this tool and this problem. And, and that's the idea of having a tool. I'm not creating a new perf. I'm not creating a new trace command. I'm just using the infrastructure that they, they give me. But another possibility is to still and have the answer from the tracing side. Well, uh, so the question is, you know. Um, right now, F trace just does everything from the kernel. I think perf. How does perf get the stack trace from user space? Does it have a user space? Because perf, everything's from perf is done from user space as well. So my question is, when if perf could get the stack trace from of the user space side, is it doing something special in the kernel? I know there's. I haven't really jumped in. And look at the code that's done. It used to use the same code. Um, uh, Peter's on, or Peter's not participating by sound. <laughs> or is Arnaldo here? No, actually, he's uh, got another presentation going on, probably in the next five minutes or so on, on another track. Because yeah. if Perf is able to do it, why can't F-Trace do it? That's my question would be. Yeah. I haven't really yeah. taken a look to see what. We get the the infrastructure for for backtracing into user space is there, so you could use it as well. Yeah. So basically, it's just something that Ftrace needs to fix, and I'll, if it's already there. Yep. Yeah. What we have for me to try to to use a uh, to make a tool that is independent that I I'm not connected necessarily for a single thing. I can use. The, the best that system can, can give me. If it's F trace, it's F trace, if it's perf, if we can fix F trace, it can add a BPF. Yep. That that's the idea. I'm not necessarily connected to a single view. So from the chat, um, Peter has responded. Uh, Peter responded with the chat. Basically what they do is just takes <laughs> like one K or so of the actual use space tack, stack and just copies it into the ring buffer and then perf will just unwind it when it gets to user space. So it's basically just tap it then. That means perf probably has to have some sort of way of looking at the user space code and figure out where things are. I mean, we could do something out of libtracefs, should be able to easily do something like that. We just have to have a new event to say, just give me a you know, user space mm -hmm. stack, just copy a bunch of it. Yeah, yeah. As long as I, wait, I have a way to, to do a function call and, and give interpretation, it's, it's easy. But yes, this, this is in that uh, a thing to make the, the trace more more, more clear. I, I agree with him. Because it's something that F-Trace should have, and it's like I've had other people request this, so I, I think I'll just fix it. Should Sebastian, you, you be able to lift what they're doing? Well, the thing is, a lot of it, it writes right into the perf ring buffer. I just have to do the same to write into the F-Trace ring buffer. And the problem with that also is, um, what Peter just said again, performance is crap. And, and actually, it, it would be good to understand where the code in user space is deal, leading, leading us to the problem. But for the trace analysis, I, I was always enough to me to understand the current side. Sebastian, Sebastian has his hand up too. Is he, are you waiting to talk? Yeah, yeah, waited. Um, in the video, is it just that you record all kind of feature, uh, features like trace events and then you try to correlate what went wrong and what it might have been? Or how do you know what event is the bad one? <clears throat> because the tracer runs, in the, the workload runs in the kernel. When it hits the, the threshold, it stops and it has the data already available for it to read. 
So you have to configure like a network packet has to be sent like every second or so. And then if it's second and a half, you, your trace hits the threshold. I, I, can hear, I'm just, I, I know, I'm not sure if I got the question, but the workload that I have here are two only. And they're specifically made for, for these tools, which is the OS noise workload in the OS noise tracer and the timer not workload in the timer not tracer. Okay, so basically you know more or less what you look for. Sorry? So basically you know what you're looking for. Yes, I know what I'm looking for. Other tools can be developed knowing what they're looking for and give you uh, also other, other let's say, uh, metrics. That, that, that's also, the, the tool is, is fresh. The more things will come and I hope they come. Yeah, we'll try to look at the code, but didn't get to it yet. Okay, thanks. Okay, sir. Thank you, Sebastian. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. <clears throat> so, uh, so I see you asked a question about RT Val, so I thought I'd say a few words. Um, so RT Val has uh, two kinds of modules. It has measurement modules and load modules. Um, right now, it's not too difficult to add load modules. Um, I've recently added stress ng. There, there's still some areas of the code where adding load modules is a little bit difficult. Um, but using the load modules for your tool, you know, you'd have everything. You can already easily compile the kernel synced with your measurement module um, or Hackbench or whatever load you're using. Um, so we have the concept of the measurement module, and that right now is basically cyclic test. So what we would have to do is extend, um, I think when <clears throat> Clark and David originally wrote the tool, they had the idea that it would be easy to swap out stuff. I'm, I'm not so sure how easy it would be nowadays, but basically we try to write a measurement module that would use your tools. Um, instead so yeah yeah i think you know it was it was kind of naive to think that dropping uh, a new measurement tool in there would be uh easy <clears throat> because everybody has different formats for their output um and you know rtval does statistical analysis based on the fact that uh, on the output of cyclic tests so we we probably need to mm -hmm. Uh, and, and the other weird factor here is, is uh, from RT of Al's point of view, is that this is that uh, RTLA is both load and tool rolled into one. Uh -huh. So it'd be kind of kind of interesting to to figure out how to make it work. Uh, but I, I, yeah. I don't think it's impossible. No, and we might want to use. Um you know, a, a concept of a, a third kind of module, which is, is built into it. But I could see how it could be advantageous for Daniel to take advantage of the infrastructure that's already there. Like, I, I think it'd be worthwhile to look into anyway. We, we well, can you know, I... The, can we make the, the second test and uh, output, for example? It would, shouldn't be hard. For example, for time or not, the second test, which are, are sibling tools. I just figured I that tried the, the histogram is somehow based on the, the second test output. Hmm. Anyways, that's all I had to say. <laughs> Thanks. No, but, I just figured that. Uh, and uh, keep, keep keeping on testing, uh, Daniel Walker. I saw that you were adding some code to automatize the the, the parsing of the output from tools. How hard it is for us to do that for RTLA? And also to connect with Lava. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the thing I've added is basically just that the histogram is uh, dumped as JSON format string. Yeah, so nothing, uh, there's nothing really, really. Um, Difficult so, there. I, mean, I, I suppose this could be easily added or extended to your. Actually, in the trace, uh, 
in the output of the histogram, I've, I've put an option to hide some data like the header or the scale, right? Or the values in the bottom, because uh, for me to write the, some histograms in using Uniplot, that helped me out. Knowing what helps you guys out in integration, it, it would be a good uh, thing to me to, to try. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Any other suggestion? Otherwise, I will start asking Stephen for, for, for features. You're, you're asking me for to request features or? I, I, I have some, some requests from Lee Teresa Fast. Okay, yes, please. I mean, <laughs> Uh, there's a bugzilla. Please submit submit everything you want. Any feature requests no, in no, the no, bugzilla. No. This, this is a conference we need to discuss here and now. <laughs> oh, Thank you me. want to discuss these features now? Sure, go ahead. But still, put them in the bugzilla. <laughs> I tell you, put them in the bugzilla because because that's where I will look into it. So, what features would you like? So uh, now on the RFC I've sent, I've added the possibility of using two uh, instances of OS noise and family life trace. That is good, right? But the reason why I need that, it's because in, I, when I dispatch the, the tool, I create one instance to collect the, the overview data and one for tracing, right? So I'm always writing twice to the buffer. So if I, and the reason I do that is because this one I'm collecting the data and displaying, right, for statistics. And this one, I just let it run until it hits a stop condition and I use it to dump. I cannot keep reading from this because the data is consumed, right? If I could have a way to collect the statistics, the data, the, without uh, cleaning up the trace buffer, I could just run off. And this would so wait. be some cycles. So you want to basically read So your request is actually a kernel change then because you want to re read that without consuming? Yeah. Is it a kernel change? Yes, because you can't read raw data without consuming. The raw data consumption, there's no way to read the raw data. You can read trace files uh, without consuming. And that's that's done very trick. A tr it has, it's a lot of trick code in the kernel to do that properly because there's a lot of races. Mm -hmm. Because you have to, while it's the right, and I finally, I updated it. So, I mean, we could read the trace you could read the trace file, I guess, if we, I'm not so sure if we could do the binary way of doing the same way. Maybe we could add a kernel change to read the binary code without, you know, but that means we have to make a copy. You have to just take a copy of, take a page and copy it because yeah, and hope that if it, and then if it gets written over, just do, just keep uh, yeah. doing it until you get it before you, it's written over. Yeah. That's how fast. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, interesting. So that 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 would save some overhead. Anyway, anyway, the things are working nicely now. Now, with, with regard to overhead, We're using noise noise tracing, if I put the threshold like one microsecond, it's still not reaching the reaching the, the overhead being higher than the threshold. So overhead wise, it's good. It's just a minor improvement. Right. So um, I, I see Masami. Just I just want to comment because Masami posted something in. Um, the uh the matrix channel or chat saying you know the trace fs you know trace do not consume trace fs trace pipe uh does but again those are ascii you know that's those are ascii outputs we're talking about the raw binary and right now the only way to get the raw binary is with a trace pipe raw with the name as the name suggests uh, that all the trace pipes are consuming buffers trace files are not i mean i could keep maybe make a trace raw and it'll be a best effort to, I mean, if your traces are slow, where the reader is much is keeps up with the writer, it shouldn't be a problem. It's when your writer is much faster than the reader, if you want to try to consume things, so it's going to go into some sort of. Uh, we'll have to do, you know, copy the page and check to see if it got written while during the copy. If it did, try again. Okay, so maybe keep two instances is the best way. I mean, I could do that. If I mean, is it something that's written very fast where you're where you can't keep up 
Uh, the, yes, it could be. If I have tracing enabled, yes, it could be. Not sure. We need to, to test the system, but it could be. But that, that we can always allocate more. more I mean, I can try it. You just have to make the trace at the highest priority process. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I don't think that would even work, too, especially if the tracing actually causes enough to do the tracing. Sometimes it has that effect. Well, you have that big event. Um, it causes the events that it's going to record. Then you have an issue. And how how big the buffer size is. Uh, like you said, I could. E it probably wouldn't be too difficult to create something. Uh, that would actually be an interesting exercise. Maybe someone mm -hmm. else would like to try writing it if they want to learn it, learn that code. Yeah, yeah. And person that you do this, please file the bugzilla. Uh, and another thing that I'm doing myself is I'm saving trace to a file. I just I just saw an option to save from a pipe, but I don't want to read from the pipe because the pipe keeps generating data. I would like to save the trace file. I'm doing now myself reading the uh, page per time, but I'm, I'm certainly. You guys certainly have a better way to do this, and, uh, and we can get out that code from from the uh, trace uh, trace command library should be coming out hopefully soon. We we're slowly doing that, and the trace command mm -hmm. library will allow you to record to a trace.dat file, even a live stream yeah. or something. Yeah, that 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 would be good. Yeah, that's uh, in the works. Uh, so something that uh, is Tom around Tom Zanuzzi? No. But that, that, that's a request that, that, that this would save me time, which is for the histograms. I currently don't, I have the histogram, but sometimes my histogram can be smaller than the values that I, I have, I receive, right? So now what I'm doing is I have a histogram that is the size I, I wish it's enough, but I still enable the trace event that generates these the data I'm, I'm creating a histogram like the the thread the thread uh, let's say the thread latency. So I or not the oh, it's my sample. Oh, it's my sample. I I use a histogram kernel, right? But when the value is higher than the histogram, I I I lose it, and I don't know which is. And I need this to compute the max, the average values, right? What I'm doing is that I'm still tracing the event that I'm creating the, the histogram, but filtering with a value one higher than the histogram. And still handling those, those, those events if they are generated to compute the, the real max and not just the max that was uh, able to fit the, the histogram. Wait, say that again, I'm confused. <clears throat> yeah, so you have a histogram, right? And yeah. histogram has a maximum value it can store. Yeah. Right? But the tools might generate a value even higher than the maximum of the histogram. How do I take note of these values? You mean from the you mean from the histogram? You mean the you know the Thompson Uzi's histogram code you're talking about with the yes, yes. Let's say I, I have a histogram that stores up to one millisecond latency, right? and I have okay. like a, a two millisecond latency. How can I read that the actually maximum value was two milliseconds and not the maximum value stored on the on the histogram? I I still don't. Uh, I guess I may have to. We may have to take this offline and you have to show me exactly yeah. what it's because I don't see. I I don't understand what exactly what you're doing because I'm like I don't have this issue. I don't. I, I'm not sure what you mean by setting a maximum value in a histogram. Usually a histogram will just record the maximum values. I've, yeah, but if, if you record all the values, but if there is a number that is higher than the the value you can store in the histogram. What do you mean the the, the value? What do you mean there's a value I can't store in the histogram? You mean you the uh, if you you mean you ran out of the max histogram? I mean the size the size that you hit all the values and you filled up the histogram? Or no 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 a value higher than the maximum. Uh, you will is there a maximum? I thought it could take any number and just shows it will just put it in there. You have bucket size of 2048 by default on histogram. Well, I thought, the, I thought it was a sparse tree. It only fills in. Uh, okay, that's something that you will see. But that's what I'm saying. Is like I, I thought it was sparse. It actually doesn't make, it doesn't break it up into, like, it doesn't say, okay, here's an allocation and everything fills in. From what I, from my understanding was, it just puts it into the, um, 
it just stores it at the value that was given. So if you have one and 10,000, it will record just two buckets, one and 10,000. It doesn't break it up into a bunch of buckets from what don't I understand. Don't, don't, don't you have a maximum number? The time is up. Right? I don't think so. Yeah, that's, that's something we should probably <laughs> fix in cyclic test is it's just a contiguous array, the, the histogram logic theory is, and we should probably make it sparse. As yeah, because well. the one in the kernel is not is is sparse. Yeah. Okay. That's why I'm confused. But we'll so, take this no, offline. Yeah. So thank you. Well, now we have a ten minutes break. Yes, ten minutes. I see you in ten minutes. By the way, um, what I would suggest, Daniel, right now, for when you do the break and you do the poll, put in. So the ten minute is on the hour of twenty five. I would say so put in okay. see you back at star colon 25 or something just so people know what that 10 minute is in the okay in, in the, the poll i think in the poll you could put in that and then daniel if you don't mind giving me moderator okay perfect hi everyone i'm Srivat sabhat um my colleague sharon and i are pleased to present our work on linux kernel support for kernel thread starvation avoidance this is something we've been looking into as part of supporting telco 5G low latency applications on the Linux real-time stack. I'll start with a brief introduction to the telco 5G use case and explain how uh, we use Linux preempt RT and then describe some of the problems you're seeing when deploying these applications in the field. And then we'll discuss some existing solutions to this problem and then um, why these solutions don't quite adequately um, address uh, the problems you're seeing. And then Sharon will cover the design and implementation of uh, a solution we propose called the stall monitor, which is a kernel thread starvation avoidance mechanism implemented directly in the Linux kernel. And finally, we'll describe some challenges and request your feedback and uh, suggestions on how to make it better. So in the telco um, 5G use case, what we have is a radio access network or RAN which consists of a radio tower as shown on the left-hand side, which sends network packets to a nearby data center running um, uh, with servers running the Linux preempt RT kernel. And the application stack involves uh, using Intel Flex RAN, which is a reference implementation of the radio access network uh, software stack or uh, radio access network architecture. And um, it, the Flex RAN software has a processing pipeline through which these uh, network packets go through and then acknowledgements are sent back to the radio tower. So what makes this a real-time system is that this entire um, flow of packets, uh, the round trip from the radio tower to the data center and back has to finish within a fixed time budget. And that budget is governed by the 3GPP specification for 5G. What it means is if the call flow doesn't complete within that particular time budget, the call flow is considered failed and has to be retried, which is cost prohibitive because uh, the 5G spectrum is expensive. So this is why the application stack demands predictable real-time response from the underlying platform. What this means for Linux is that um, when RAN vendors try to evaluate Linux platforms uh, to see if it works well for 5G, they expect a scheduling latency as measured by cyclic test to be under 10 microseconds. But the 5G use case actually has even more stringent configurations where any kind of sleep and wake up latency is unacceptable. So um, the FlexRAN software stack is designed using Intel's TPDK, which, does, um, which allows user space applications to directly pull for network packets and process them completely in user space without ever having to take a, a round trip to the kernel. So that helps us uh, design these low latency applications. So let's see what kind of issues arise when deploying FlexRAN like applications on Linux preempt RT. So uh, on a typical Linux system um, uh, for uh, FlexRAN or uh, RAN kind of workloads, we uh, start by dividing up the available CPUs into no hurtsful isolated cores designed to run the or designated to run the real time application. And then the remaining cores, uh, what we call housekeeping cores, run the um, OS uh, background threads or essential services and even non-RT workloads. And the y-axis shows task priority and uh, uh, higher up uh, vertically, uh, the task uh, has higher priority. So for instance, um, here I'm showing the L1 app, which is the layer one processing of FlexRAN, run, running as an infinite loop, that is a CPU intensive DPDK based application 
with high real-time priority SCED 5490, which means it's higher than pretty much any kernel thread in Linux. Right? At the same time, on housekeeping cores, we have uh, essential system services like SSHD, SystemD, NetworkD, and so on. And then also Kubernetes control plane tasks, uh, in, including kubelet, containerd, dockerd, and uh, so on. Right? So in this scenario, whatever you do on housekeeping cores can actually end up waking kernel threads on every CPU. For instance, uh, we see this K thread getting woken up on the isolated core running the L1 app with a lower real-time priority SCAT 501. So uh, in, in this picture, the solid boxes indicate tasks that are actually running, whereas the dashed box indicates uh, tasks that are runnable but stopped. They don't get any CPU time. Right, so uh, in this case, the K thread is actually starving because the L1 app, which is running on the same core, the isolated core, is a high priority real-time task and it never yields the CPU. It's very CPU intensive, right? So that leads us to our problem statement. Essentially, kernel threads that are starved in the system lead to cascading lockups and cause a system-wide hang eventually because um, the scenario can happen such a way that these kernel threads or whatever invoke these kernel threads hold resources that other applications need and because the kernel thread doesn't make any more progress, uh, it's permanently starved, so it locks up the entire system. Everybody waits on that resource, right? What we'd like instead is to have, a OS, have an OS that remains stable, meaning all its kernel threads, essential services, everything makes progress and uh, remains available while limiting the fault domain to the real-time application itself. So the uh, real-time application, if it is uh, misconfigured or misbehaving, it can starve or uh, experience a crash or abort or whatever, but uh, the OS itself must remain stable and we should be able to access it and uh, you know, troubleshoot it. So let's see uh, a specific example of this problem, how this comes about. So a classic reproducer that we have is container destroy. It creates a hang immediately. So uh, the reproducer is essentially just run a high priority CPU hog, uh, real-time CPU hog on an isolated core and then create and destroy a Docker container on a housekeeping CPU. Let's see how this creates a hang. So here I'm showing top output uh, from this particular scenario where we are looking at CPU three, which is no hertz full and isolated. And it's running the loop party task, um, which is a high priority infinite loop uh, with sket 5455, right? And um, at the same time, we also create and destroy a Docker container from one of the housekeeping CPUs. So as you can see, there are two um, runnable tasks on CPU three. One is loop RT, of course, and the other one is kworker slash three, right? The kworker slash three is a per CPU kernel thread uh, uh, and it can only run on CPU three, so it cannot be migrated away. That also woke up on, on the same CPU. And it, on the left-hand side, you can see that the priority is actually um, uh, lesser than loop RT because kworker is a normal priority task. It's not a real-time task, right? And um, as you can imagine, uh, the loop RT program has continues to make progress. You can see that the time uh, column shows uh, that loop RT has been running for one minute, 32 seconds at the time I took the snapshot. But kworker slash three is completely starved out. It's, uh, it's stuck at zero time, zero execution time, right? Let's see how this comes about, right? So essentially when we destroy a container, uh, you can see the stack dump from a Docker D where it's trying to um, invoke th this function called rollback registered many, right? That's part of the network namespace teardown mechanism in the networking subsystem. And that in turn invokes flush work, which wakes up per CPU kernel threads on every CPU to participate in the network namespace teardown. However, we know from this uh, picture that the flush work will never complete because the K worker on CPU three is never going to make any more progress. It's permanently stopped, right? But that's not all. Uh, in fact, it turns out that this particular call flow, which calls you know, flush all backlogs and leads to the um, uh, kernel threads getting woken up everywhere, holds the RTNL lock, which is a very popular lock in the networking subsystem. So what this means is after this particular point, any other task, uh, any other application that is uh, requesting kernel services in the networking subsystem, which needs the RTNL lock will also get stuck in uninterruptible sleep state, D state. So here I'm showing a stack trace from system D network D, which is trying to send a socket message, but uh, ends up waiting on the RTNL lock. Uh, and it'll never get that lock because the entire system is stuck in this particular state. 
right? So similarly, we have other applications also getting stuck in the same path, which leads to the cascading lockup that I was talking about. We've seen this issue with SSHD, SystemD, NetworkD, the package manager, uh, and, and, and pretty much anything else that touches networking. So essentially networking is out, which leads to the hang, right? But then this problem is not limited to the network namespace uh, destroy code or the networking subsystem in general. We have seen the same kind of issue where you know you wake up kernel threads everywhere and then uh, have a hard time uh, making progress because you have uh, CPU intensive real time tasks running. And we have seen this issue with ext4, C groups, ftrace, sysctl, uh, and a variety of other subsystems. Right. So we'd like to have a generic solution to this problem. So let's um, let's talk about uh, some existing solutions uh, to this problem. And before I jump into SolD, I want to quickly mention that the real-time throttling feature in Linux is completely ineffective in solving this problem because it does not protect low-priority real-time threads from uh, starvation issue. It only caters to non-real-time threads. Whereas in Linux, we have kernel threads that are both real-time and non-real-time. Right. So that's a no-go. Staldi was introduced by uh, the Red Hat team, uh, Daniel, Yuri, and Clark, in last year's LPC in the real-time microconference, precisely to solve this particular problem. Right? So Staldi is a user space daemon that keeps monitoring the system for starving tasks. That is, those tasks that are runnable but not getting any CPU time for an extended period of uh, time, and then gives them temporary priority boosts using the SCED deadline policy. And the great thing about Staldi is it performs this boosting and revives the system by operating within user configurable bounds of OS jitter. So for example, a user can say that I can give you like 10 microseconds of CPU time in every one second period, and you can do whatever boosting you want to do to keep the system healthy. And Staldi will honor these bounds, right? In fact, Staldi, uh, this particular problem is so prevalent in the RAN application space that Staldi has become critical to these deployments to maintain stability. In other words, um, without stall D, these applications would not have any meaningful uptime. So we'd like to really appreciate and thank the Red Hat team for developing and contributing stall D to the open source community. However, deploying stall D and RAN applications in the field, we have come across a number of limitations of stall D that actually make it hard to use in practice. Take scalability, for instance. Stall D scales in principle, but not in practice. The reason being, um, Staldi has or creates a thread, a P thread for every CPU that it wants to monitor and potentially boost starving uh, tasks. But then the use of ISOL CPUs for real time workloads means that all of Staldi threads are bunched together and forced to run only on the housekeeping cores. So, for instance, if you have a 20 core Linux system with 18 of them isolated to run the real time uh, application stack and two cores left as housekeeping CPUs. Potentially 20 stalled threads are all waiting to run or are competing to run on the two available housekeeping cores. So it doesn't scale with the number of CPUs. What's even worse is stalled can get starved itself. So stalled is a normal priority program. Uh, so it has to compete for CPU time on these housekeeping CPUs, right? But then housekeeping CPUs are not sitting idle. Like we saw before, it runs OS housekeeping tasks um, and also uh, non real time workloads like the Kubernetes control plane. So it has to, so Staldi may not get sufficient CPU time on these housekeeping cores to do all the monitoring and boosting that it needs to do. Attempt, attempting to solve this problem by making Staldi a real-time priority application is actually risky because depending on the um, user configuration of Staldi and how aggressive that is, it can so happen that all of Staldi threads potentially end up consuming most of the available CPU time on these housekeeping CPUs, thereby starving out other tasks. In other words, Staldi, instead of becoming a solution, it can cause the problem itself and um, starve out other applications. Staldi has a bunch of other issues. For example, its logging is actually unreliable. So it uh, Staldi logs its output to uh, journal control logs via systemd journaldy, but then journaldy itself can get stuck on ext4 code paths. Right. So in the best case, what we've seen is Staldi continues to make uh, progress in the sense that it monitors and boosts uh, boost starving kernel threads, but then its execution flow and boosting decisions uh, cannot be traced back to the logs because uh, generally is not logging anything. But in the worst case, we've seen an even um, 
kind of more severe instance of this problem where if we increase Staldi's logging to get more uh, insight into what's actually happening, Staldi can get stuck trying to write to this IPC socket uh, to uh, journal D. And therefore, Staldi also stops monitoring and boosting kernel threads, making it completely ineffective in preventing a system hang. Right. One final point I want to highlight here is um, there is a trade-off between the response time uh, from Staldi to prevent a starvation event um, and its CPU consumption. Because Staldi has to keep looking at proc get debug file and pass it to understand if there is a potential starvation condition happening, and it does this from every single thread in, in, in Staldi, uh, it can be pretty uh, CPU intensive. So Staldi offers a, a single threaded mode uh, where you can choose to do all of the monitoring and boosting from a single uh, thread of Staldi. But then um, this is a tricky trade-off in practice because um, as we saw before, most of these hangs occur because of per CPU K threads becoming starved on every CPU, right? So that means a single thread of Staldi has to potentially boost, ev uh, monitor and boost multiple kernel threads at the same time. So it, it may not be uh, that good of a trade-off for response time. So it can still create a hang. Can, what can I'd I like just to make some sorry. Can I just sure, make yeah. some updates on these? These things were true, were true. So to mm -hmm. say, not not if any study is not the best in the world. It was made right. to be someday uh, uh, overwritten by something else, like using PL servers. This long topic, but some of these topics here they are not let's say updated, right? I see. <clears throat> so the single threaded mode, mm -hmm. it is now it now. That trade-off of CPU consumption response time, it was listed off, it doesn't exist anymore. So it's performing as well as the, the you, you don't need to use the multiple threaded anymore. It performed as precise as the single threaded version. It was, this, this problem was solved some months ago already. So, I see. And, uh, and now that fixed the first problem. So not saying that, not, not about any reason, just clarify points, right? So now it's still doing words, uh, it's one thread per any CPUs. So it, it can scale better. Uh, regarding Stoud is starving itself, now that it's a single thread, you can easily set it to run as a, uh, a SCAD deadline. And uh, editing priorities to, to a process, that's a long time discussion in the kernel. It's not the uh, responsibility of the kernel, it's the responsibility of the user. So setting uh, RT priority now that the multiple thread problems were fixed should not be a problem. And we have been using it for a while. And actually setting the real time uh, priority fixes the problem of if Stoudi uses, uh, if you use like logging using, uh, let's say journal D, if right. Saudi logs in a, 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 a mutex that's depending on there, if Saudi mm -hmm. has a higher priority, as it doesn't consume as much, much CPU as it used to consume, it can run, it's safe, uh, it right. would unlock that, uh, that log because of the priority inheritance. Anyway, uh, you can use log directly to the kernel. You don't need to use that kind of, uh, of uh, log anymore if you don't want to. So this, this, many of these problems pointed here were, were fixed in the latest version, just to clarify. I see. We'll, we'll definitely check that out. Thank you. Cool. Um, so um, so uh, given our understanding of limitations of Staldi at the time, we felt that many of these limitations um, actually trace back to some design decisions in Staldi, uh, including something as fundamental as uh, the decision to implement Staldi as a user space program. So we decided to uh, seek a better solution to this problem that addresses all of these limitations in the field. And we came up with uh, something uh, we call the stall monitor, which is essentially Staldi like boosting and uh, monitoring of uh, kernel threats in the Linux kernel uh, for uh, starving kernel threats. And I'd like to invite Sharon to go over the design and implementation of stall monitor. And Daniel, can you make him presenter, please? Just a second, finding names in the list. Uh, okay, you're the presenter. I did Someone it. else was faster than me. <laughs> yep, thank you. Um, so, right, so with these limitations in mind, we had certain goals that we wanted to achieve and we'd like to 
mention those goals and why we think the kernel is suited to uh, meet them. So firstly, we want to prevent uh, kernel threats from starving uh, by having an in-kernel starvation avoidance mechanism. We're really attempting to compartmentalize the fault domain. We want to avoid situations where these workloads causing kernel threats to uh, star result in the entire system hanging up. Uh, we want to be able to keep the OS stable and limit hangs to just the application threats. Um, the second goal is to ensure scalability. So the only things that become runnable on uh, these ISOL CPUs other than the application hoggers are the first CPU kernel threats. And uh, they are the ones experiencing starvation. So uh, the starvation detection problem is naturally per CPU. And if we have uh, per CPU scheduler hooks to monitor for starvation, that will tend to scale well. Uh, there's no need for system-wide monitoring or cross-CPU coordination. Uh, we want to be able to monitor and boost efficiently. We want to avoid unnecessary periodic monitoring. So if we can hook on to uh, scheduler events like tasks waking up or tasks being taken off the run queue, that gives us the opportunity to make these decisions efficiently. And guarantee responsiveness. Uh, we uh, don't want to be in a place where the entity responsible for starvation avoidance is itself starving. So uh, because the scheduler will be aware, aware of a task becoming vulnerable, we can be sure of getting a chance to start monitoring. So keeping these goals in mind, we have certain features within the stall monitor. So each CPU will keep track of only starving kernel threats. And not just that, it will be the kernel threats that are meant to run only on that CPU. Uh, so we'll have one HR timer in uh, each CPU, and that HR timer will run only if there are kernel threads runnable on that CPU. And uh, while it is running, it will be meant to, it will run for one of two uh, reasons. It will either uh, run to detect starvation using the starvation threshold time, or it will uh, track uh, how long a boosted task has, has been running with the elevated priority. Um, then we... given time and we want to do the boosting or deboosting in hard IRQ context of the HR timer. Uh, we don't want to hand it off to soft IRQ and wait for another kernel thread to run uh, because that's the uh, problem we're trying to solve. And uh, finally, uh, similar to stall these uh, values like starvation threshold time, boost duration time, and the shed deadline parameters like runtime and period will all be user uh, exposed and user defined through maybe SysCTL so that uh, the jitter that may come in because of boosting or deboosting doesn't uh, surprise the user. Um, so uh, I'd like to quickly go through the flowchart of the algorithm. So uh, in uh, NQ task, when a task gets added on to a CPU's run queue, we uh, essentially check if it's a kernel thread that's about to get added. And if it is, then we add it to a starvation monitoring list, which is a, another per CPU data structure. And we start off the HR timer in starvation detection mode. Uh, uh, that is if it's not already running. And then we proceed to finish rest of the NQ process. And uh, when the HR timer callback, when the HR timer expires, we receive the interrupt and we enter the callback function. We first try to figure out what mode we were running in, were we in starvation detection mode or were we trying to deboost? Um, in starvation detection mode, we essentially look through the CPU starvation monitoring list and see if any of the kernel threads are starving. If uh, it is the case, then we replenish the same timer with the boost duration. Um, if there are no starving kernel threads and if the starvation list is empty, then we just stop the timer. And uh, if there are, then we just uh, re replenish the same timer with the starvation threshold time and we come back again to see if any of the tasks have uh, uh, experienced starvation. So, IRQ exit. So, we uh, attempted to do the boosting and deboosting using sketch set attributes, and we initially attempted to do this in the callback function. Uh, but we noticed that uh, the priority inheritance code uh, doesn't allow us to do invoke this function from uh, interrupt context. So uh, we waited for the uh, hard IRQ uh, flag to be masked in IRQ exit, and then invoke this function. So this is still technically in interrupt context, and we know that this is not the right place to do it, or per perhaps not even the right API to invoke this. 
to uh, do boosting or uh, deboosting. So that is a segue into uh, what we uh, seek from the because we want this to happen in hard IRQ context. What is the right way to invoke this? Uh, are there better alternatives to doing this boosting uh, and deboosting? We also thought if we should use CPU stopper threads, uh, which are shed 5.499 to achieve this. Uh, some of the other questions we have is, do we restrict the monitoring and boosting to ISOL CPUs alone? Because that's where the starvation is. And uh, we also want to evaluate how much latency does this introduce? Because the starvation algorithm is running in hard IRP context. And we're also uh, adding Sean, kernel. Uh, yeah, he has a question. I was, like, have him. Um, yeah, sorry. I was uh, just, just so they understand completely. So you are doing... Uh, this bit in in the isolated CPUs. So basically, the CPUs that are running the the actual workload that you care about are also running. I mean, potentially, basically setting timers and doing those things as well. Um, yes, this happens on the ISOL CPUs as well. But uh, this all this will run only if the if there are any kernel threads runnable on the ISOL CPU itself. Yeah, but then how do you Guarantee that uh, all these uh, happens like uh, in less than say ten microseconds. If that's your uh, threshold for meeting the workload requirement, because basically uh, until until you this, because we we went through I think all these type of options uh, already. We stole the and actually I'll uh, post in the in the share notes something that I posted upstream uh, in the Linux kernel uh, mailing list uh, kind of last year then I didn't have time to work on uh, uh, farther but then uh, we realized that uh, if you are I mean the isolated CPUs are already running something that don't want to doesn't want to really be interrupted interrupted ever and uh, I'm just worrying that uh, by doing this type of uh, calculations and actually adding timers on the same as related CPU, so you're, ba you're basically breaking the assumption of something that doesn't want to be interrupted ever, right? Yeah, that, that's why Stouty runs it as a thread and not as a per CPU. And on the, on the housekeeping CPUs, so that yeah. uh, basically all the overhead that you pay for running this whole D monitor, it's only paid on the housekeeping and also the, for example, the set scheduler calls also, they were associated to to, that, to those calls are only paid by the housekeeping CPUs. Basically, the so, only overhead. <laughs> so, one thing I want to mention, from what I understand from when they showed this to me, was that uh, this is all configurable because you don't need even. I mean, there could be a timeout, but I guess um, you can configure when this happens. Uh, threads are only woken up at certain times, correct? So, or. <laughs> It, it, it's the, pro the problem is, is even before this, it's, it's uh, where to put the workload, right? So with StoD, you are better. Let, let's use a parallel, RCU, a nice parallel. With RCU, we have per CPU uh, uh, data processing, which are the process of RCU callbacks, right? You, well, one step on the, uh, on the tuning of this kind of system is moving RCU callbacks out of the CPU. Why? Because you, you don't want noise on the CPU that you're running the BSD. The BS loop is your fast path. That's the thing that you care more about. So we offload the process of RCU to isolated CPUs. And we also have another option on RCU, which is RCU no CP pool, that instead of relying on IRQs on isolated CPU, a thread pools for need of trying to, to, to run uh, uh, RCU callbacks on the callbacks of uh, offloaded uh, threads. Style D is the same parallel. You get a solution of trying to move workloads to the CPU will make Style D work disappear from top, but you are just moving it to a critical path, which is the isolated uh, CPU. Same tuning will be required for, 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 for this. So you have the problem that there's you had, you have callbacks offline, you try to, to do things without creating uh, CPU uh, per CPU IRQ, and boom, you have started back. Right. So, uh, right. So, uh, note that if the application is running on ISOL core and you have a kernel thread that becomes runnable there and gets starved, 
Um, at this point, we have to boost it one way or the other, right? So we will take some time to run this kind of thread, whether using stall D or stall monitor, whatever it is, right? And what we're aiming for is the amount of time that kernel thread runs is actually user configurable. Uh, if it's, let's say, 10 microseconds in a one second period or whatever, right? And mm -hmm. what we're, I think, talking about here is the additional latency that the stall monitor itself introduces uh, by, you know, uh, noting down potential starving kernel threads and so on. So, um, right. Right, so one thing that could be done is try to reduce, uh, first of all, evaluate how much latency that actually is, and then try to reduce that. But then the other thing that you brought, brought up with uh, RCU is actually um, another um, stream of investigation we wanna take up, which is why don't we just fix the subsystems that are creating this kernel or waking up kernel threads on ISOL cores that uh, didn't even participate in whatever mechanism was going on. For example, the container destroy, right? The ISOL core had nothing to do with the container creation or destroy. So why did we even wake up those kernel threads? So in, in a way, enhancing the no herds isolation mode so that you actually keep that task running. So you don't have to do any kind of boosting or uh, have starvation events. But then the problem is, um, this is actually a widespread problem. You have to fix many, many subsystems. So uh, this is more like a solution today to actually um, yeah. uh, address the problem. Yeah. But the, the point that we are raising is that we know that the overhead that you guys are editing with a persecute time is higher than the overhead that Stout is running. Because Stout only sends a schedule API to the isolated CPU. Both and are space, the wrong way. Yeah, I Sorry. agree. That's why Stout is user space. And, and in what, the future. What, really, <laughs> what, what, what I really do not get, I mean, uh, how many man years have been spent on developing Staldi and Staldi next generation and whatever, instead of actually looking at the underlying problem and fix that. I mean, it's not rocket science. Most of the pain points are known and there are patches actually floating around. There are shitty patches, but they could be polished up. So we yeah. waste in resources on things which are completely bonkers. Why? That's why, why, that's, why the, you use Saudi, that's why Saudi is user space. We don't need to care, uh, to care alone. Yeah, yet you're, alone still, but, you're still putting a serious amount of resources into Stall D. No, no, to, not yet, not yet anymore. Not yet. It, it's uh, basically uh, cleaning up now. Maybe uh, one thing that can be added. I, I completely agree with you, Thomas. Uh, I personally consider Stall D like uh, mostly a debugging tool than uh, a proper thing that can be kind of relied upon on production. So what we use it for uh, in the early development stages of basically the same type of applications is to understand what was actually starving on authority CPUs and then look at the actual problem and fix the problem in the kernel. And then basically the, the, what we use it for now is that if SOLD actually logs uh, that is boosting anything, that's the problem. And we need to solve it uh, in it, the kernel. It's a band aid in production. It's a band aid. It's a band aid. Pretty, pretty much what the, this this other guy who was doing this full isolation mode thing. Uh, I mean, the patches are horrible, but he he actually has some instrumentation in the in the in the entry code added. He wanted to add that, um, uh, which. Uh, signals that uh, there's a violation of the full isolation mode, which is nice because you can have a trace point there and you can figure that out. So, so you, need, you don't need even necessarily install D uh, and just use uh, existing infrastructure to, to, to decode that. But then there were patches floating around for, for various uh, things like uh, the, the I did some of them myself uh, uh, versus RT, but then we got other solutions because the memory management people didn't like it. And I recently got an email from someone, oh, what happened to your patches versus VM, whatever it was, swap or something, which, which runs a worker on all CPUs, which is stupid because you can do exactly the same thing uh, on the housekeeping CPU, you just need uh, locking around something which is uh, not locked today because it's strictly per CPU. But the patch, the, and, and there have been a lot of attempts to, to, to fix the, the real fundamental underlying uh, problems, but they, they all 
went only half the way. So, I mean, really, uh, what, 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 what's really wondering is me is a lot of people are interested in that no hats full mode, and I was doing the groundwork with Frederick. Uh, I don't know how many uh, years ago it was. It's at least fifteen or something like that. Um, <laughs> but we're still at at a point where we just uh, are not able to actually sit down and say, "Hey, here are the fundamental problems. Here are the solutions," and then fix up the stupid subsystems one by one. I mean, we are doing the same thing with RT uh, for exactly that time frame or long or longer. And, and it's the only way to actually get something done. Because yeah. every, whatever you do, whether it's Stall D or, or Photon D or whatever, it's going to be a Band-Aid, which is just just not, not working well. And I as Alex as Glenn Elliott said on the on the on on, a, on the chat, I mean, you really can run uh, run the 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 thing without all these bells and whistles, because I was analyzing some of the five G crap as well, and it actually spends a reasonable amount of time in polling, even if fully loaded, on the in user space. So you can really grab some percentage of the of the runtime, and you can do that with the with with Suki deadline today. So. Uh, I have a hard time why people really try to solve problems the wrong way around and then are happy that they have the next solution which is not helping anything. It's just yes. make things worse. We agree, we agree. And when we hope to throw away yeah, something right. someday yeah. in the garbage. And that's why it's in user space. We don't want to create any a thing that connects us with the future, Lira and I. And we don't want to create a future for a <laughs> That, that we will have to carry along the way for years. That's why it's in user space. We just can throw away. And uh, we also believe that no hurts full, full no hurts full is, is, is the way to go. Right. Uh, so just to uh, echo Daniel, uh, even though we try to implement this in kernel space, we don't think, uh, we I agree, uh, I agree with uh, Thomas. This is not the final solution. Uh, like you said, we need to fix the subsystems or even uh, or, uh, the task isolation patch set, whatever makes no hurts actually work well uh, for these workloads, right? So um, are there some major design problems you see in that patch set uh, in terms of adoption? So it's been floating around for a while now, right? So what do you think are the roadblocks? Mm -hmm. One thing I immediately saw is um, it needs the application to modify uh, it, the application to be modified to use, you know, uh, process control calls to actually say when it goes to uh, no hurts mode uh, or isolation mode. Um, I mean, that's a minor. That's really a minor problem. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the the main the main issue is that we know, and a lot of the things which cause unnecessary workarounds or unnecessary IP IPIs are well known to everybody who is using no heads full for how long so but why are we not sitting down and actually having something like the rt patch set in as an external collection of fixes which actually tackle the real problem and then uh, and then go and gradually merge them into the mainline kernel i mean that's way uh, better better time spans than, than anything else. So I just compare it to the RT problem. Oh, we could have done RT by an RT demon 20 years ago, right? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but that would ha wouldn't have solved the problem. But and, did yeah, that so I, I think. I tried that. Wait, the, the time, um, actually, the time is up for, for five minutes, for four minutes. We, we can continue discussion on the mailing list. So I can pitch four minutes longer. Moderator fail. Sorry, guys. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was caught okay. up in the discussion. Look, 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 look we, can, we can discuss this, this, this time from the polls. And uh, by Andrea, by Brazil, it's, uh, I will save you. What? Thank you. 
Hello, everybody. Hello, Thomas. Hello, Peter. I made you the presenter. You can select oh. your slides. So, oops, uh, not slide. Okay, better now. So, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending my Futex talk again. So, um, just a reminder why uh, I'm working on Futex 2. Well, basically because uh, the current interface will not get new features and uh, me and other developers, we are trying to make Futex work better with more uh, modern workloads or new features. And uh, the issues that we're trying to solve here are basically no more awareness. Uh, we want to support various size for Futex, not only 32 bits, and we want to be able to wait on multiple Futex. That is the most uh, important feature to me uh, because I propose uh, interface to wait on multiple Futex on the uh, current syscall, but then it got rejected and people said to me, hey, if you want to merge this, you need to develop a, a whole new interface and I say, why not? And we're here we are. So the session is to get, uh, to have a look on this interface. It's the most important part of the syscall because it needs to be stable. And, um, and yeah, just, it's just an overview of what we are trying to solve in this interface. And so, and how do you get this interface merged? So uh, futex.c uh, is quite a long and complex file. And the first step to get new things there is to do our factor. And thank you, thank you very much, Peter, for stepping up, stepping up and doing that. Uh, Peter, I read And uh, can you hear me? Let's say that I lost. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, okay. You, uh, you, you froze my... a little bit, but now you should be fine. Uh, let me. Okay. Can you see me again? Um. Maybe if you're having network issues, or do you have network issues? If you're having network issues, maybe you probably don't want your video on. If that's the, if you're having network issues. Okay. Okay. I'll turn off again. Okay, but the voice is okay, right? Yep, we we can hear you. Cool. So, uh, cool. So, uh, the first step is to 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 do the refactor, and this is uh, done, I think. And uh, uh, so, and we are going to reuse most of the code of uh, the Futex. We are not going to re-implement the, the Futex code base. Uh, no more multiplexing. We are going to have one syscall per operation, and uh, and we are going to merge uh, smaller patches. So the first patch that uh, I'm working on, that is, uh, as I said before, uh, is the wait on multiple. And this is, we, we, we did a lot of progress uh, for now. And this is the interface that I proposed uh, in the beginning of the month. This is the interface that Peter resent on the mailing list uh, uh, one week ago, I believe. And uh, for this interface to get merged, I believe that we have just two small points to uh, debate, to discuss. So uh, just, initially an, an overview of how the interface looks like. So the first argument uh, is, oh, Peter, you can hear me? I don't know if Peter is- I can uh, hear you. Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, I don't know if Peter has his mic on or mic on. He's been just replying in chat. Oh, okay. Uh, so maybe ask Peter to refresh, I don't know. Well. Okay, uh, so anyway, so this is the, the first argument is a pointer to an array of waiters. And then uh, the second argument is the, the number, the, the length of the array, and then the flags, because every syscall needs the flags arguments. And then we have the timeout argument, so we don't wait forever. Um, and this is the structure where we store the waiter uh, information. So the first argument here is uh, the expected value as in the few text weight. Um, each waiter has expected value. 
and okay, I'm here you actually, can okay, hold a pause because Peter Zilstra is telling me he can't hear you. Okay. I mean, I don't everyone know. else can hear him, so it's actually it's Peter's side. Um, maybe you should log off and log on again. But do you hear now? Or no? Um, oh, maybe Peter will just have to go back and watch the videos. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Continue. I, was, I guess. I was looking forward for the Peter input actually. So. Oh, so if you need his input, I, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I would like to give him another minute if possible. Yeah. Okay. He's logging off and logging back on again. And worse comes worse, he could watch it live on YouTube. Okay. Um, do you mind messaging him? Like, yeah, okay, we are. Yeah, yeah, we're right. messaging. Okay. Yeah. So, Peter, let us know when you uh, hear things. So we're all waiting for you. Well, actually, he can't hear me, so I have to tell him. <laughs> uh, okay. What if I should just whistle Jeopardy's music while we wait for him? Please. <laughs> Please don't. I'll mute you, dude. I beat Someone you too. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Now it doesn't seem like he's even replying on IRC. And no, don't worry, Andrea. We have a a large pause after this this topic, and we can use that now. Oh, well. okay, perfect. It's not a problem. So why I will move on then? Okay. So uh, no, as I mean, I, I, mean, I mean, if I mean, if you want to to wait for Peter. Ah, okay, okay, okay. okay. We, we can we can manage the time. Don't oh don't, don't worry. Hello, Peter. Can you hear me? Since that is working, cool. Let's go. So, as I as I, I was saying, here we have the expected value, and you can see that we are using uh, six four bit here because uh, the new interface should support that. And here we have uh, six four bit for the address instead of using a pointer. I will explain that later. And now we have uh, here we have the flags because each waiter can have individual flags because. Each, uh, you can have uh, shared full taxes and private full taxes on the list. And the reserver field is just for padding, but it can be extendable. So the first point of uh, discussion is about the timeout because uh, internally on the kernel side, we work with assigned 604 for storing the time. And the first thing that we do when we call a full text Cisco is to convert from time spec to uh, K time. And I believe that every Cisco will actually do that. And while time spec is like POSIX, is ISO C, is the standard, um, Peter suggested that we could move, move on and just use U64 for now on for new Cisco's. And, uh, and yeah, this is. My first question, uh, why why not or why should we move in that direction? Or is everyone, everyone okay with using Unsigned 64 for timeouts for now on? Uh, I mean, there's, this is a, a, a battle I'm fighting for years now. And there's this POSIX purist camp, which is, no, the world consists of time specs. Uh, even if every user space programmer hates time specs with a passion, because you always have to do the normalizing. If you add stuff or uh, subtract stuff, it's a it's a real pain. So most people, what they do, uh, if they want to do math on time specs, they convert it to nanoseconds and then convert it back to a time spec, which is really really brilliant. But it's POSIX. Uh, the religion works. So, um, yeah, I, I'm all for uh, going for a U64. 
and I really don't care if that doesn't work. Uh, what uh, uh, if it stops working in 500 plus years from now? Um, so yeah, it's. I mean, I go for applause time. I'm not going to fight that that battle uh, to to the end. You, we could always uh, make a glibc or something where either you pass into the kernel a time spec and have the uh, you know, libc pass in time and do the conversion for you. That way it would work after that time period, 500 years later from now. Yeah, whatever. So, I mean, I mean, I, um, I think we, we should just go with the times, uh, with the 64 bit, uh, not the, 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 we don't want to have the compact versus versus a non-compact time spec uh, problem. We really want to have the kernel time spec, which has a 64-bit seconds value. Um, when you use this code, and then yeah, so that's it. Because what I fear is if we really go for the U64. Um, we're going to have a long time until um, Chilipsy people or whoever will actually give in and 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 agree, and we have to to collaborate with them on those uh, interfaces anyway. So um, the much I hate it, the most practical thing is probably just going with time uh, with kernel times back, which is uh, which is. Um, uh, a 64 second, uh, 64 bit seconds member, and be done with it. I mean, yeah, it's not pretty, but yes. Okay, uh, thank you for your input. Uh, yes, uh, the the Cisco uh, supports the 64. On on the chat, uh, the question is whether to use absolute or relative timeouts. So uh, actually, aren't we want want to have both? Uh, so the or application scenarios where we really want to go with an absolute time up because you want to to follow a longer uh, uh, periodic um, timeline, uh, and that's a pain to do with uh, relative timeouts. Uh, and then we have also the interesting problem of uh, what the old Futex the the old futex uh, um one of the futex operations i think it was futex wait it supported only relative timeouts which violates the posix spec because um actually uh, the posix spec says it's an absolute timeout um on on pz uh, mutex wait timeout uh, but then the the Due to the kernel implementation, this was converted into a relative timeout, which is not affected by clock set, uh, clock was set events, and people really uh, got into trouble uh, for some uh, application scenarios until we actually provided a, a variant which lets you select what you want to have. Okay, cool. So uh, I believe the decision is to move on with time spec 64 and use absolute timeouts, right? Right, and, absolute uh, timeouts and uh, selectable between, uh, as we do now for most for most of this, uh, the the POSIX uh, uh, functions, uh, the Futex fun uh, the Futex operations, we have either uh monotonic and real yeah, clock or real time sorry which is good enough okay i don't cool. need a clock argument for that oh sorry i meant uh real time not real clock <laughs> yeah real time clock so, real time yes yeah so i'm not i mean the other the other option would be to actually hand in a hand in a clock id as we do for for the for the uh, POSIX, POSIX clock calls, POSIX interfaces, 
uh, the time-related interfaces. It's, it's not the worst thing to think about because if you look at uh, what's coming in um, various application scenarios uh, like um, uh, related to time sensitive networking and they talk about uh, yes I hate it but it's it's also a real problem uh, they need to have uh, clock tie variants or TS, uh, PTP time variants, which are which are completely disconnected from clock time and, and clock, uh, clock real time. So it might be actually uh, uh, worthwhile to think about handing in uh, a real clock ID instead of um, handing in uh, just a, a binary flag, whether real time or monotonic. It shouldn't be hard. Uh, it, to do that, so, so you just have an, an an extra argument to the syscall, which is fine because we only have one, two, three, four, and five is fine. Um, okay, but um, why would that be better than the flag? I think I missed that, that part. Uh, because you then can, uh, uh, well, in the first place, you only on, you only support. Uh, clock real time and clock monotonic, but we can then extend it to arbitrary clock IDs. Uh, okay, I see. So, so uh, for the benefit of those of those of us trying to take notes here, I lost what I don't know if there was a decision made or a recommendation made on whether we're going to uh, pass in a U64 time or whether we're going to use no, kernel no, time no, spec. Uh, so that this. No, so we we stick with the time spec. Okay. Uh, as Arn pointed out, there's another 32-bit problem. Uh, if we go for U64 uh, nanosecond uh, scalar value, uh, then on 32-bit uh, uh, we can't uh, pass it by value. We can only can pass it by reference, which doesn't solve the problem, because then we again end up with compensator scores. Which we want, which we don't want to, and we have the GLIPC and the holy uh, time spec uh, religion camp yeah. uh, hating us. So we rather make progress and and use something they they are happy with. But uh, the other thing I uh, we just talked about about the. Uh, about the clock ID, I think that's more future-proof than just having a bit value uh, which says monotonic or or real time. Uh, so you're actual... talking about adding an, an argument to Futex weight v that is the actual clock to be used. Yes. So flags and then the yes. clock ID flags, and then the, a, a mostly, time. Mostly related to to the, the Futex itself and right. and then the ID is actually so related to the timeout. Yeah, don't overload flags with a clock ID. Do that yes. separately. No, uh, no, no, it 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 can't fit because uh, uh, of the other magic uh, clock IDs we have. Uh, so, I think that's the most flexible solution for for the future because we we are going to see interesting uh, notions of time in our systems in in the not so far away future. The much I hate it. Um, okay, cool. So I think um, we can now move to the next uh, topic, uh, which is um, the structure of the waiters. So, uh, as I showed before, this is the proposed structure to, to store the, the waiters. But uh, people pointed out in the, the mailing list that uh, this will waste memory for 32 bit applications, since like one quarter of the, system, the, the structure will be empty. Um, so, the other so the, the solution to that is to have this struct here on the right, on the center, center of the slide, where uh, you have, of course, the UU64 value, and then you have the pointer for the address. 
and then you have uh, your flags. And it seems that uh, people still run 32-bit user space to save some memory. And going on the other way around will, of course, uh, use more memory that, uh, and this is um, on the other way of the goal of running 32-bit user space. So, um, uh, any feedbacks, any, can we go with that district or even better, Peter sent uh, another solution for district. And, uh, and yes, uh, so I would like to, to get feedback about uh, which layout of the structure we should use. Uh, I'm not convinced about how, this, how it saves so much memory argument. I mean, what were to, are we talking about? So running 32-bit uh, code obviously saves memory. Saving a few bytes on the few text weight, weight structure does not. Yes, but does it really matter? So first of all, the, the structure that you have on the slide doesn't actually work on 64-bit, so we need to have padding anyway. And then it gets complicated because then we need different amounts of padding. Um, yeah, but the, 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 the original first one works about, right? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? The original proposed one, the one you had in the previous slide, and, and which is strike through on this slide, I mean, it just works on both. Yes, it does, uh, but the, pro the problem is... It, 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 it costs four bytes per, per array entry. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is... Where is the freaking problem? Uh, so I'm sorry. I think it costs eight bytes because you also have the uh, reserved field in the previous structure. So it's going to be one whole kilobyte because you can have 128 of this structure. When I was benchmarking this a couple of years ago, I think the biggest contention was in the copy from user, and this is what we'll be doing copy from user from. So I, I think this one whole kilobyte might mean something. What's the maximum array size we have? 128. 128. Yes. So, so, you, so we talk about 128 times four byte, right? Eight bytes. No. Four bytes. I mean, the reserved flag is not going away, really. So the, the structure he put on the slide is daft. Um, it should be a U long value, U long U order, if you're going to compare. Yes. And in that and case, you, you uh, place four bytes of value and four bytes of U adder. And and you want the reserved field. I mean, it's not going away for for compact. And it's it's we shouldn't decide. There's a clear a clear thing that we shouldn't shouldn't uh, uh, I mean yes for the for the structure we could get rid of the reserved field so yeah so then you get 12 bytes times 128 yeah so so if we if we stick with with u64 u64 and u and u32 we have Eight, uh, sixteen, and four uh, makes bytes, right? That's twenty-four well, against twelve. You you get a hole in that structure due to alignment uh, constraints, so you'll get twenty-four bytes anyway. For the array. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, if you if you do compat uh, a U32 value, a U32 address, and a U32 flags, then there are no alignment constraints, and you're uh, to three, four byte words, which is 12 instead of 24, which is half. Right. Well, would it be, uh, the, was there alignment constraints on 64-bit? 
Because the, the, the structure has... There. The lemma constraint is there as soon as you have to use 64 member, whether on 32 or 64 bit. Because structure alignment takes the, the, the biggest alignment constraints of its members. Right. And the performance argument, I, I'm still not buying it to optimize for 32 bit machines because 32 bit machines are the ones where, where people don't care about performance because we only care about cost at this point. Nobody cares about micro optimizations for 32 bits. So I don't think that the mem copy speed is of any value. The only optimization that I can think of as important is making the code look the same so we can share the implementation between the two. Like even Microsoft is ditching 32 bit, right? Well, for Windows 11? <laughs> yeah. Well, you can still run 32-bit applications, and everybody does. And we also do, but 32-bit applications do not have to be faster than 64-bit applications. That's not something we should optimize for. And OK, and uh, so about the uh, the astro memory, in, in the end, is not so much memory. This is the, the conclusion. Yeah, Trevor is saying he's stuck on to a 32 bit machine is interested in performance. So that, that, really... that may well be, but performance of the Futex syscall is not what's going to make the difference for him. No. This is, this is a very specialized system call that you do use on machines where you care about performance a lot on large workloads. We're not caring about the workloads on 32-bit machines that this system call is meant for. Right. Well, this particular, the weight vector, is meant for Wine and Proton. Yes, exactly. And uh, there is a lot of 32-bit uh, uh, Windows applications and Windows games uh, that runs on Linux. So, but yeah, this, this... But seriously, but seriously, if you copy a kilobyte more of hot uh, of cache hot memory or not, it really doesn't matter. Okay. And how often would you even have like a fully populated array? Like usually, I'd expect you'd have a couple of things in there, and you can have the corner case where you have 128, but that's going to be the really rare case. Well, so so what does Wine do? I, I think Windows NT or something has 64 for the multiple weight thing. And then we did Futex for 128 just cause. Um, yes, uh, the, the, the maximum for Windows is 64. And I actually don't remember how we did get in 128. Uh, I think for the wine implementation, we had 64 and we had to use some internal things. So the next, somebody just wrapped it up for the next uh, power of two. But we need 64 to serve that interface. Yeah. Yeah, so the worst case of 128 long vector doesn't even happen on, on the, the expected workloads. It's just 64 and, and a few. Yes, yes, you're right. So, yeah, let's just keep the code as is, and 32-bit and will hopefully eventually die and go away, and then nobody cares. <laughs> okay, so um, one, one question. Uh, you shared, uh, so uh, the switch on the, this slide here, it works great, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so this, so actually this is how the interface would, would look like, right? Oh, and the Thomas plus not, the Thomas not clock, clock, ID clock ID. ID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus the clock ID argument. But the rest is fine, right? Or do someone yeah. want to, 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 to give more feedback on the interface? Or can we move for the next part? Okay, so I'll move on. 
So thanks everyone about uh, giving the, the feedbacks on the written mood poll. And um, I will send a, um, actually, okay, uh, I need to show out the argument. I will take your, your tree, Peter, and add the argument stuff and uh, resend to the mailing list. And this is the interface for Wait on Mood Poll. But in the future, we will also want to uh, add more th the other syscalls, syscalls to support uh, wage and wake using 64 arguments. And this is how the wage and wake uh, system calls look like. Uh, I don't think we have anything to change here. Um, the, the only thing that we, we need to clock ID, yes, exactly, the clock ID. And uh, yes, uh, if someone wants to give some feedback, but but I think this is very simple part. Uh, so for the flags, we have we have the, the private flag as usual. The clock spec we we won't have anymore. We have a argument for that, and we have the four size that we won't support. So you have the uh, flag for each waiter, and this is where things get complicated again. So we want to have new awareness on Futex, and right now the current implementation have a single global hash table, but uh, with uh, Futex Numa, we will have one table per Numa node. And how do you specify which node do you want to operate on? So one suggestion a uh, long time ago on the mailing list was to use a struct. So instead of using this uh, here on void user address, instead of passing the address, the address of the Futex that you want to wait on, you send this struct. So the first part is indeed the Futex word, and the second part is what called Futex uh, the, the hint that is like the node ID where you want to operate on. And uh, so the hint could be zero until the the number the max number node, or if you send minus one, you want to operate on your current node. So uh, feedbacks about that. This seems uh, Reliable? Do you have no more people around around here? I don't think that's really workable. So for one, uh, for one, uh, making you as a point to something else than the actual few text values, just introducing more code and more overhead, it's not worth it. So the question is, can we have enough uh, uh, room in the flags to to actually uh, 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 hold the hold the new out. No, no, no. You need storage. So um, the, the problem is when you do a wake from a different CPU or different node, then you did wait on. How are how are you going to find the actual uh, hash bucket? I was uh, Peter. I was coming to that. Um, that's the next thing. To I mean. Uh, Sebastian and I looked into that years ago, and we actually posted patches where you had to register your um, your uh, uh, few ahead of time. Uh, that works because otherwise we won't find it anymore. Or you have to, in the worst case, if it's not on the local node, uh, you have to walk the the hash uh, the hashes of of the other nodes as well and until you find it and that's going to be horrible in 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 terms of performance yeah i know been there done that yeah so i mean the the thing we sebastian and i did back then worked perfectly fine it's it, it's really performant and it's really really nice uh, the only hassle is that uh, people hated the notion of having to register the field text in in uh, upfront yeah because a lot of people don't know what node they're on or what node they're going to be staying on and especially with stuff like the the numa balancing um that might change over time yes i mean that that's that's true i mean it's 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 not an i don't know so and, and in that regard, adding user storage, I mean it's it's just extending the 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 Futex value 
you just store it wherever you 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 put the uh, bucket in, and then on wake up you're just gonna look at that one node, and then if you find it good, if you don't, also good. Yeah, but but I mean the so what you what you lose that way is is if you point let you out or point at Futex thirty two numa, you restrict you restrict that NUMA add-on uh, to 32-bit values instead of, uh, and you basically take it away for 64-bit values, which some of the Chile uh, people really want to have. And of course, if you specify in, in the previous slide a NUMA 64, then it will be a Futex 64 NUMA structure with oh. two 64-bit words. Okay. I feel yeah, very. Well, you don't care. I know. I I figured I'd do it anyway. <laughs> well, because we had to wait for uh, Peter to get online, didn't we say we're going to delay it? Delay it. Let it go. We already <laughs> delayed it. Oh, did you? I would. I had a phone call and I had to take it, so I missed the so, last five minutes. So Peter, Peter, uh, if we if we denote the the availability of a Numa hint in flags. Uh, then this becomes an orthogonal problem, right? So yeah, that was the idea. So if you have this extra word in user space, you, you, you add the flag. And that basically says the user space value is double what you expect it to, and the kernel can write whatever it wants in there. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm fine with that. So we don't we 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 keep that in mind, but we do not implement it right away because that's an orthogonal problem and it's a lot of thought. Okay. All right. So, so for the sake of the poor note takers, um, do we have any conclusion on the uh, numa oriented uh, futex weight? solution is i mean i heard a lot go back and forth the question is we have firm conclusions or is it just well we need to look at this more we'll need to look at it at it more we have ideas but we have to actually look at them in in more details because there's quite some uh interesting questions open so it's it, there's not no final conclusion but the final conclusion is that we think it is an orthogonal problem and we can solve it with an extra flag and therefore we don't need to implement it right away. Right, so so also we need buy-in from the GLIPC people or whoever is actually wanting to use this because there's more than GLIPC. I think some JVMs also use Futex raw and I know DB2 is. Um, Quite some, quite some databases use use the 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 Rosen's code. Yeah, exactly. And other crap. <laughs> of course. Uh, okay, so I think uh, that's it for Futex two this year at least. <laughs> and thank you everyone for uh, the feedbacks. Thank you. Thomas Peter. And then, yeah, that's it for me today. Thank you, everyone. Yes, I am ready. I will pass the comment. Okay, let me just turn this. Okay, so I'll go ahead and start. Okay. You are really ready. Yes, now I'm really ready. Okay, so I'm just here to talk about the current status of print K and uh, a lot of people ask the question, why is print K Uber even related to, to real time, <laughs> because it's not something you typically think of as, as real time. So just to quickly uh, recap the reason why print K is such an issue uh, is that when someone calls the print K function, you may print the line that you want to print actually out to the console. You may print no lines. You may end up printing like a thousand lines that are backlog. It depends on the situation. So basically it's totally non-deterministic uh, how long this print K call could take. Uh, and of course the consoles we know can be really slow. Serial consoles, uh, for example, 
uh, with low uh, baud rates uh, could really slow down that, that print K call. And of course, print K is allowed to be called anywhere. So, you know, often it is called in inconvenient contexts. For example, uh, preemption is disabled and that's not okay for real time, obviously, that we, we print out a thousand messages to serial while preemption is disabled. Uh, and so this is why it's for preempt RT, this is a particular problem that we have to deal with. And you see down here that, uh, you know, we could just avoid printing from time, sen time sensitive context. That is the workaround we used in the four dot kernels, for example, the preempt RT kernels. If you look at like 419, you'll see that when it's time to print, we check, uh, are we preemptible, are interrupts enabled? Okay, then we will actually do the printing, right? So that's one solution. But the, then you have to wait for someone who, uh, you know, when someone's printing from an interrupt context or something, then nothing gets printed, right? So then you have to hope that at some point someone comes along that's uh, preemptible uh, so that the message actually shows up, right? So that's not really a solution, and we need to find a, a correct solution for this. So we made the main decision, basically two big changes that we just wanted to change fundamentally with print K. Uh, the first, uh, and, and they're about decoupling the print K callers from the printing, right? So we want, it's okay to call print K wherever, we just don't want that to be, that caller to be responsible for actually pushing it out to the consoles, right? And this is actually two main components that are, that are responsible for that. So the first one is that we have a, a a ring buffer or the print K buffer, the D message buffer, uh, that is able to store messages from any context. Doesn't matter if it's NMI or in scheduler context, whatever. And we actually have that done now. With 515, you know, we, we see that we introduced a complete new, uh, completely from scratch, uh, lockless ring buffer, multi-reader, multi-writer, uh, variable length, uh, lockless ring buffer. All the crash tools were updated. Uh, we had to re-implement the log uh, continuous message uh, so that we could support uh, doing continuous messages from NMI context. Uh, the log buff lock was removed in 512. Basically, these were the training wheels. They were left on, even though we had a lockless buffer, but with 5.12, we actually pulled those training wheels off so that it was truly lockless. And with 5.15, we also removed the safe buffers. So now if you're in NMI context and you call print K, that's really going directly into the buffer, uh, directly into the real D message buffer, right? So this is a great, so fundamental position that we want it to be in, it's totally, it does not matter where you are in the kernel, you could be uh, you know, in some sort of uh, strange R RCU callback, or you can be in the, the scheduler code and you can really do print Ks and they're just going locklessly now into uh, this ring buffer. But that's just the first part. And that was the fundament that we now have as of 5.15, it's now totally in there. So, uh, and that was mostly mostly a technical uh, a feat to, to figure out how to implement the ring buffer and how to get it in without anybody noticing. So this is something that's taken about a year now and now it's in there. The second thing we want to do is we want to, you know, because even though we're doing this lockless printing, uh, I'm sorry, this lockless writing to the, the ring buffer, we're still printing in the context from the caller, right? So we haven't decoupled yet. We've just prepared for that. So the second stage is we actually want to have separate dedicated kernel threads that actually do the printing. And if we can get to that stage, then print K is truly lockless. It can be called from anywhere and we don't have to worry about context or anything uh, for calling print K, right? So maybe even things like trace print K won't be as, as interesting anymore uh, because you can actually use print K to debug uh, just about anything. Now, this is the component that's not mainline yet. And the reason why it's not uh, so simple is, you know, obviously if you're just creating the kernel threads for the printers, that in itself is easy. And most of the printing would work just fine. But there are situations where the K thread cannot print. Uh, for example, when I'm shutting down the system, there's gonna be a point where the CPUs go offline and the threads aren't there anymore. And now you have these final messages, ACPI, power down or whatever, you know, there are these, these final messages that come. Uh, they wouldn't show up, right? So, you know, K threads can't help us there. Or for example, if you have early pr in print K turned on, early print K will, will print out everything immediately, but as soon as a, a regular uh, console registers, print K stops, deregisters, and a normal console takes over, takes over. However, at that point, we don't have kernel threads yet. 
So it means you would have a, you know, you'd see the early print K and then you'd have maybe a half a second pause before all the rest of the printing continues because we had that gap there with the kernel threads uh, weren't there yet. Obviously in the panic situation, uh, when we're just uh, crashing in some situation, we can't rely on the kernel threads to put anything out. And then also for kernel debugging with KGDB, uh, that's also something where we cannot rely on the kernel threads because all of the CPUs are quiesced. So the idea going forward here is that we would kind of use this method that we're using until now so that the print K callers are actually the one pushing them out, uh, that we will, we will actually use that for these windows where we're not in panic situation, for example, and when we're shutting down, then we're going to go ahead and al allow the print K callers to push out uh, the messages. For real time, that's not a good thing because that could we will have situations where preemption is disabled, but the idea is, is we're shutting down the system, and so perhaps uh, we can we can deal with that. Right? And the other window is between yeah this early print K and, until K threads are there, right? So that's also a situation where we don't expect our kernel to be, to be performing real time yet. So that's also a situation where we can go ahead and allow the uh, the print K callers to push the messages directly out, right? So just in those end and beginning situations. Uh, what we're also having there is we're introducing a new function called PR flush. And PR flush is a, it's some, it's a sleepable function. And this function can be called by anyone if they really want to make sure that all the messages that have gone into the buffer have that they're actually flushed out to all the consoles. And we can do this in the PR flush context, right? So the person who's the, the task that's calling PR flush, that's the task that's also going to push out all of the, of the remaining issues. Uh, PR flush is a might sleep function, so uh, that's totally okay that, that we can do that there. Now for the situation with, with uh, panics, uh, it's a little bit trickier because we don't wanna use the uh, interesting techniques that we're using right now, busting spin locks, ignoring spin locks, and just kind of uh, trying for that. So what we're, what we're doing is we're introducing something called atomic consoles that are actually only activated in a panic situation. And actually we'll probably, for the main line, it might be re probably renamed, renamed to panic consoles because it really is only in this panic situation. And what these panic consoles or atomic consoles are is that they will locklessly just push out the data to the devices that support that. So for example, if it's a serial port, this is relatively easy to implement, uh, locklessly pushing out the data. Now, atomic consoles, even though it's only in the panic situation, so you know they don't have to do so much worry about synchronization, they do have to worry about one case of synchronization, and that is what is, what is if, what's if we were pushing data out on the serial and we panicked in that moment, right? So we have the normal console drivers that were in the middle of doing something, and now we hit this panic situation. So we do need to have some way to uh, synchronize the regular consoles with these atomic consoles. And for that, we have something called the print case CPU lock, which is basically a CPU reentrant spin lock, which means uh, within the same CPU, I can keep grabbing this lock. So if I was in a, you know, a preemptible uh, context and then an interrupt comes, uh, I, I'm allowed to grab that again. Maybe an NMI now comes, I'm also allowed to re-grab that. But all the other CPUs, uh, if they try to grab this lock, they'll spin. So it's just to keep other CPUs out. It's not a real lock because I still, uh, I can't, I'm not really synchronizing all this for the same CPU, right? Because, you know, there still could be these interrupt contexts. So I still have to implement atomic consoles lockless, uh, but at least I don't have to worry about other CPUs uh, coming into there. Now for the preempt RT patch, I actually implemented a separate call for this called write atomic. Uh, but uh, later it was pointed out to me uh, that KGDB actually also has a set of, of uh, polling callbacks that work very similar. They're mostly lockless and most of the serial devices support these. So I'm actually looking into, can I recycle that code or can we build uh, the atomic console stuff around that? And we'll, at the, in the last slide, the next slide, uh, I'll just kind of summarize that. Now, for the topic of KDB, KGDB, this is also something very interesting because uh, KGDB basically will quiesce all of the CPUs except for the one uh, primary, so KG, KGDB CPU. And all the other CPUs will just be spinning in NMI context, waiting for something to do. And uh, the problem is, is 
you know, when we're, the kernel's debugging itself. And so what we have to decide here is what's more important. Is it more important that if KGDB crashes, that we see a stack trace from KGDB, meaning that this atomic console uh, infrastructure is underneath, is deeper, lower level than KGDB. Uh, is that what we want to see? Or is it, do we want to be able to step through the atomic console code with KGDB, right? So it's the, we, I haven't been able to figure out how we could do both, and I don't think it's possible. We have to figure out, do we want to be able to step through atomic consoles, or do we want atomic, account, atomic consoles to be the fundamental level of the kernel so that if KGDB crashes, we have a nice stack trace there? So that's really uh, what that's about, and I've had discussions uh, which, I'll, which, which we see here with Daniel Thompson from Lenaro, uh, who's really the, the primary uh, maintainer, I would say, for KGB and, and this, uh, this work there. Uh, and his idea was, could we have, for example, KGDB uh, take this CPU lock from another uh, task that already has it, right? So let's say we have a, a situation where the CPU lock is, be, is taken from a CPU and then the kernel, it's a panic and we jump into KGDB. So now uh, that task that was holding that CPU lock will jump into the NMI, will be interrupted into an NMI context that's now spinning, but it's holding the CPU lock, right? So if it's holding the CPU lock, then no other CPU can do atomic printing, right? And so now my primary KGDB master is not able to do atomic printing uh, because it doesn't have the lock this CPU lock. And so the one idea from Daniel Thompson was, can we transfer that ownership? And generally when you're talking about locks, this kind of defies the concept of lock, but I haven't thrown this idea out because the CPU lock is not a real lock. The primary purpose of the CPU lock is to prevent other CPUs from getting into there simultaneously. But in KGDB, we've quiesced all the other CPUs. So transferring that now to the KGDB primary, uh, might actually make sense so that the, the, the primary KGDB is now also there. It's, it's also making sure that no other CPUs can get in there because it's the only one that's running, right? Now, of course, if we're gonna do that, if control is ever restored back to that original owner, obviously it has to be transferred back before that quiesce is, is released so that it can continue. Uh, but this is something that uh, I'm still looking into how uh, we would like to do it. Might, might so, be interesting to consider changing the name of, of what you're now calling a, a console lock because it's really not a lock and that kind of drags along a whole bunch of baggage with it. I, um, I totally agree. I'm really bad at naming. If someone has yeah, a better well, name for that thing. I don't, have a, I don't have a good suggestion for you either. I suck at That's why I'm not in marketing. Uh, but, CPU but, synchronizer? Uh, yeah, CPU. I mean, should, probably should be something catchy there, uh, Stephen, <laughs> but, you know, uh, which... Synchron CPU, CPU sync. synchronizer or not. Okay, All right, I could go with it. And the anyway, thing is, I is it present, this isn't new in the kernel, actually. We've had these before, and I'm, I'm uh, consolidating them also because you, actually, if you have multiple in the system, it's a uh, deadlock danger there. And in all of them that we've had, there was never comments saying what they were. There was no s names that made sense, right? So, uh, yeah. But yeah, I agree that CPU lock is, is, is a bad name just because that word lock is misleading, uh, especially if developers of atomic consoles, they will make use of that thing to help them synchronize, right? So if they think that it's a lock, uh, then they might be having issues. It's not a lock. It's just preventing simultaneous uh, access to the to, to section, for example. Uh, yeah, so that's a good idea. I'm open for names. Uh, what was it, CPU sync or something like this? Uh, that's, uh, I'll take it, right? Yeah, CPU sync or whatever. You put that in the you put that in the notes. So this last slide here is basically showing uh, on the left hand side. You see the way preempt RT has uh, implemented these final issues right now, and what I may have to change for mainline uh, mainline acceptance. So for example, currently we're using also atomic consoles in this window here because we want in preempt RT, the idea was it also looks nice when early uh, print K immediately hands over to, uh, you know, continues to print. You don't have this gap of, you know, you don't, we don't lose messages, but there's just a time where nothing is printed while we're waiting for those K threads. So currently preempt RT is using the atomic consoles for that. Um, if we 
for mainline, that's not going to be acceptable. The main argument from the print K maintainer is we can't assume that people have atomic consoles, right? And so he wants there to be continual printing in that case. So we will, the way it'll probably end up being is that, you know, like I mentioned in the slide before, we'll use the way we're using now where the print K caller is the one that'll do the actual printing. We can't do that for RT, right? Because uh, if if there's interrupts and things that are happening there, we can't print. So that means in RT, you probably, if you turn on RT, you'll probably will see a gap of no printing. Uh, Unless we want to do it like I've implemented now for RT and say, let's, these are atomic consoles that can be used anytime, not just at, at the panic situation, and we use them there. So this is a behavior change uh, that, in particular, the preempt RT people will notice that now all of a sudden, you know, they see the early print K, and then there's a half a second of nothing, and then it'll suddenly continue when the K threads are there. Uh, I'm not sure if that's acceptable. It's, it'll go into mainline well, but I'm not sure for the preempt RT people that's uh, acceptable. Uh, also, PR flush in uh, the in preempt RT currently just simply waits, right? So it's just waiting for those threads uh, to finish printing. Uh, but if we say, may, no, we want to allow print, there's going to be situations where print K callers are allowed to print. I named them, you know, like when we start up and when we're closing down. Then we can just change PR flush to actually do the printing, which is what I actually prefer. And that's uh, the way it's going to go in mainline. That's the way it makes sense. It's it's uh, more effective than what's currently in, in preempt RT right now. Uh, for non-panic termination, uh, PR flush is currently being called. Uh, but like I said, in the preempt RT, it's just now waiting and hoping that the kernel threads are printing. On the non-panic situation, actually, that works pretty good. You do see these final messages at the end. Uh, but I'll for mainline, I'll also be changing it uh, so that in that moment when we are going into the shutdown, any print case that happen there are also allowed to call this. Again, for preempt RT, we're not allowed to do that, right? Because there will be situations. I mean, we can do some context checking. We, we can check if we're in, in an IRQ and if preemptible uh, so that we could try to do it in RT as well. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, that's not is reliable with preempt RT. So there's a risk there that, uh, you know, maybe with preempt RT, you don't see certain messages, right? So these are the things that I'm kind of uh, the battling to get it into mainline because mainline wants the behavior to be exactly as it has been. Uh, and for preempt RT, basically, but I've been using these atomic consoles uh, to kind of push everything out. Unfortunately, the atomic console is only available on the 8250 UART. So if you have anything else, uh, then basically you don't see any atomic, atomic consoles in preempt RT right now. Uh, another thing uh, that I did is in the panic situation, preempt RT currently only uses atomic consoles for print for printing out those dumps. So, for example, uh, in preempt RT right now, if you don't have an 8250, you aren't going to see backtraces, right? Because there's just no atomic consoles that are available for you. And and of course, the, the idea is we want to implement atomic consoles for everything. But the question is, how, do we have to wait for that before we get it mainline, right? So uh, we, this idea of only using atomic consoles for printing the panic, uh, I'm going to get away from that. And the idea now for my next version uh, is that if atomic consoles are available, it'll use them just for that stack trace, right? When we go into this panic, we do the back trace, and it will try to use atomic consoles for that full back trace. And then it'll fall back to what we have today, which is uh, bus spin locks and just try whatever. So it's just the best effort to try to get whatever's out there, right? So on, for people that don't have atomic consoles, the behavior will be the same as today. Uh, but hopefully, you know, if you're dealing with a real-time system, uh, hopefully you have an atomic console available and then you have that guarantee. And to get to continue on the atomic console topic, uh, these, these uh, polling APIs are really available for a lot of the consoles. So I'm now also debating rather than having a new like write atomic callback, maybe I could just have a generic write atomic function that is making use of these polling APIs that already exist. Now I've looked in, for example, the 8250, uh, the 8250 polling API does actually have scenarios where it can take a spin lock and that's not going to be allowed. So I might have to, you know, play around with, with some of these, uh, a polling APIs, but that might be a, a better chance or a better shot into mainline rather than introducing a whole nother function that everyone now has to implement. 
I'm not really sure. I know and there's a lot of subsystems where they have these callback functions and most of the people just map the callback functions to a generic function, right? So we could have that so that, you know, if the polling API is programmed the way it needs to be, then people can just map it to the generic uh, function. Something that uh, I'm, I'm just currently thinking about for the, for the next version. And the last two things are about KGB. Uh, and currently the way it is in preempt RT is if you're holding this CPU sync uh, uh, object and uh, you jump into KGDB, so you're jumping into this spinning NMI context, uh, currently in preempt RT I've implemented that you see that you are the, you're holding this. And so what it does is it'll exit out the NMI context, allow the, the stack to do whatever it wanted to do. And when we're releasing releasing that CPU sync object, it'll re-trigger the NMI to go back into KGDB. Uh, the idea being, we don't want any of these quiesced CPUs to be holding that CPU lock or that CPU sync object, right? So that's the way I've implemented there. But Daniel Thompson uh, says that he's not convinced that that will work in lots of situations. KGDB has a lot of tricky features where you can uh, switch which CPU is the KGDB primary CPU. And so there's, he's not convinced that that should work, although I'm not really understanding because if, if the CPU lock, no one's holding the CPU lock or the CPU sync object, yeah, then who cares if we're switching back and forth, right? Uh, but I have to look at it in detail. Uh, and really consider this idea of transferring ownership. Uh, it's just about supporting these KGDB features where you can just, uh, you know, command different CPUs or allow others to take over. Also, KGDB has that feature that anything you do, uh, for example, in, in KGDB or KDB is mirrored on all the other consoles. So if I type in a command or I type, I want to see a backtrace or anything, all the other consoles on the system mirror that output and actually even the input that I type. Uh, and it does it with a really, really horrible hack of setting oops in progress and uh, pretending like we're crashing to kind of trick these, uh, these different console drivers to, to print, right? Uh, and uh, we really want to get away from that. And so uh, the preempt RT is using the atomic consoles for this as well. Uh, however, you know, maybe that's another thing where we say, okay, with the polling API or, you know, somehow I want to get away from, from this dirty trick of, uh, of tricking consoles to thinking we're crashing or things like that. So, so these are just little things that I just uh, still need to clean up, uh, clean up there. Question, Clark. Or comment. Help, helps to unmute. Um, so I wanted to make sure I understood uh the the concept the the constraints you have on atomic consoles right now and it sounded to me like the only actual atomic console we have on either preempt rt or mainline is an actual physical uart 650 ur uh, is that is that correct or did i scramble that some so mainline has uh, these uh polling apis uh mainline actually has uh, for almost all of the consoles they have a polling api available and the polling API is what KGDB uses, which, which is basically a lock list. However, like I said, KGDB uses tricks to, to kind of sets, sets oops in progress, which, which might help. I haven't looked at all of them, but most of them seem to be pretty lock list. Where they're just, you know, putting a byte in the TX FIFO and waiting till the TX FIFO is empty. And that's pretty much how all of them have implemented. But it's just the UR. So, you know, the net console and the graphic consoles uh, are not implementing the KGDB. Uh, the polling we APIs. don't. We don't have that on preempt RT right now. We don't have those those polling APIs. Is what you're saying? They're okay. also available. They're also available, but I'm not. I'm not using them, right? So I actually, I'm only. I only implemented the A250, and I just have a new callback called write atomic, and you just give it a string, and it just does it. But and so I was looking at my implementation of write atomic and comparing it with the A250 polling API that it also implemented, and there are similarities. But for example, they gotcha. possibly could take a spin lock, and that's absolutely unacceptable uh, for, for the cons for the atomic console. Yeah, I was just confused. Situation normal. Okay. Any other comments or questions? So I actually presented a. a version one LKML a couple of weeks ago that did most of this, most of this groundwork, but a lot of these things that now you see on the right hand side, these changes 
are just things that came back from Pinner. He's a great maintainer from Print Bay. Uh, he's, you know, if you look at the things I'm doing here, is there's a lot of hard line. Basically, I was like, I don't care if you don't have a Tama console, she don't see it. You know, I was just basically throwing out a lot of stuff, uh, which obviously is not going to be acceptable for mainline. So, uh, you know, we're trying, we're working together to try to find a middle ground. My main concern is, is that, uh, you know, for the, the preempt RT experience, you know, you know, when it's booting, you'll have a pause that you don't see messages. Obviously, you know, if it crashes, you will because the atomic console, uh, but, uh, you know, you will have the pauses there or, or when you're shutting down, I'm worried that you might not see those final ECPI power down messages or things like this. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's the kind of things I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking at right now. And the KGDB is also causing a uh, considerable headache just because uh, KGDB is, is extremely complex. It's used its own CPU sync uh, objects. Uh, and, you know, uh, I just have to, to dig into that because it's really sensitive code. Uh, and, you know, my, my method of just saying, hey, let's just make sure I don't hold, hold that CPU lock. That was, that was kind of an easy fix, but it, it, that may not also be good enough. So we have to see. We got a question from Sebastian. Sure. John, regarding the atomic consoles, what's wrong actually with implementing it for the other drivers as well and making it somehow mandatory to have it? You know, it's just work that needs to be done. Uh, so, you know, Peter is uh, the, the print key maintainer, he's, he's expressed. He does not want to take things in the main line that are having missing pieces, right? He wants it to come into main line uh, ready to go. And so I'm, my concern with that approach is now we have to implement 60 uh, atomic consoles before this code can be acceptable to mainline, which I would, you know, I guess that's a direction we could take as well, but uh, I, yeah, I mean, that would probably, I mean, if I had help from other people, we could probably have enough manpower to get it done in a few months, but it's a, it's a lot of drivers and you have to learn, you know, a lot of these serial drives, even the 8250, it's not just a, a simple driver that you have to worry about. Uh, you do have to worry about interrupts and the interrupt, uh, the enable interrupt register, and it's actually quite complex to do that lockless. You know, if, if you were to look at the preempt or key patch on the 8250 uh, atomic console implementation, it's not trivial. And I had to spend a lot of time to understand that the, that hardware and details so that I could do that. So now if we say, okay, I have 60 different UR chips, uh, I, we have to understand them in the detail to understand, can we do lock list and how do we do that? And uh, it's just a lot of effort. So I'm, you don't, I'm you don't think we trying could to find a way around to, You don't think we could convince Petter to, to allow us to phase it in uh, one particular device at a time? It, he's open, open for that as long as it means that for people that don't have it, they have the experience that they have today, right? That's that's the key. Yeah. They don't yeah. want this experience to change. And uh, th with the things that I've written here on the right hand side, uh, if we ignore all this, the, the atomic parts, uh, these first three items that'll allow people to have the exact same experience they have today, which is what we need. And then, you know, maybe we could say, if you have an atomic console, console, your experience is even better. And then we just implement them one after the other, right? I think Greg has something to say. All right, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. We can't, we can't do it for all of them at once. Let's do the main one, the 8250, and then that's, then we can phase them in after that. It should not be a limiting factor. Yeah. Because yeah, there's no that's... way some of these embedded crazy SSEs, you're ever going to get them all. If somebody, like Thomas said, we give them the option, they want to do it, they can do it. So, yeah, you know, uh, I'm just kind of proud of Copy me explicitly, because I, I, I've been watching the patches go by, but I missed that Peter was complaining about that. He's not complaining, it's, it's a valid concern, right? And like I said, the way I implemented it in pre-MRT, uh, people without atomic consoles have a definite disadvantage, right? And he said that's not okay, and it was correct for him to say that, right? So, no, no, that's okay. uh, so we're, we're just turning it around and saying, okay, let's make atomic consoles a plus if you have it, and if you don't have it, it's the same uh, craziness we've had until now. Okay, right? yeah, so, yeah, that's fair enough, yes, yes, if you want to do that that way. Right, so that's kind of, that's kind of how we're going about it. But don't worry about that, getting all consoles. I there. think that's the right way to go. So we give them, so we, we try to, yeah, keep it halfway as comfortable with, with what we have now, with all the, the downsides. But if we give them the option for a sane uh, panic interface, and that's 
I think, important for a lot of people anyway, uh, because what we are, have right now, uh, in 90% of the times, you're not getting what you want to see. So people should be an, you know, should be easy to convince to actually implement that uh, with their special knowledge of their hardware. Uh, so when, the, when we sat down uh, a few years ago um, with all the involved people uh, and talked about this, then there was consensus in the room that even the, uh, also the, the graphics people wanted to have this dedicated interface so they really can act upon it and not say, uh, yeah, which crystal ball should we use to figure out what's going on? I think that's that's the main the main advantage we're getting here. And uh, I would just like to point out, we don't have any real roadblocks, right? So we really have the mainline community behind us. Where I'm really curious what will happen is with these threads in general, because it will be a slight behavior change. Yeah? You, people, if you're using the preempt RT, you maybe already notice it, that these messages come slightly delayed. Uh, you know, if you have a machine that's very, very busy, uh, those threads might not get as much chance to e even be scheduled, right? So uh, you might be, you might have to decide you want to, for certain consoles, you want to give them a real time priority or something so that you, those messages can come out uh, more uh, immediate. But these are things that we've never had to deal with before, right? No, I don't think it's a real problem because most of the message is really just noise. And and people grab it via where the the K message uh, interface anyway it goes into this like and whatever and 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 is analyzed. So the consoles it themselves. Uh, I mean, if I look at the serial console, I always hate it. Uh, and the only thing I hope, the reason why I have it on is because if the, the thing crashes, I want to see what what's going on, and it's the most reliable we have today still in 2021. So, no, it's not a problem of what, whether it gets delayed or not. People don't care. I mean, this, if you, if you look at, a, 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 at most uh, installs, they have quiet on and hate it when you, when you have uh, actually warnings coming, popping up during boot, so they want to have it nice and calm. So I don't think it's a real problem. I agree. <laughs> we'll see what the people say. <laughs> and of course, I don't know. I, I, do people still use Peter Zilstra's uh, early print K hack that just turned everything into early print K when you want to see? It kills the latency in case there's a D message, but when you're debugging I, something. I uh, I used it two days ago, to be fair. Should we, I was wondering, should we try to get that main line or just have an option to turn, like a command line option to say, screw it, you know, this will kill latency, but command line option just, and and accept his patches, I don't know. It it, it has a command line option. It, it, it's all nice and shiny. You, you say you uh, force early print K and then this happens. Yeah, the problem is it's not actually Multi CPU safe, SMP safe, right? So uh, it it has the crummy CPU wide locking thing on. Yeah, it has. He Peter implemented like the uh, that CPU sync thing that we have or that you have, or it's it's you know formally known as uh, the CPU print K CPU lock. Peter has that in his, so it is SMP safe. Okay. Yeah, because without that. It's it's really unusable. Yeah, I mean uh, that would be simply implement, right? So as as long as this is a debugging option, yeah, why not? Um, the interesting yeah, thing I can, is, I can send them again because I've been carrying it for years now. But Peter, if you have actually a console which allows the the or it provides the atomic or panic or whatever we name it right then having this makes it even easier because it always goes straight through 
Enfin, if we if we actually have a, a, a console like an a, a, a 8250, which provides the atomic write callback, and then your option force uh, early print K will just always write directly through. And, and correct, and that's not... the feature. Pardon? That's the feature. Yes, but, but the thing is, once once the console gains uh, that that um, uh, that callback, then it's actually capable of, of doing uh, this uh, force force straight through the thing. Uh, while while today. Um, Forcing it on anything else than A two fifty, no. So I rather see that implemented on top of that interface. Yeah, that's sure. I mean, I, I've been using it on on pure serial ports because that's the only actual reliable output we have. But yes, but, but the thing is. I mean, uh, if we if we uh, have what 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 uh, John is actually implementing right now, and then get this 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 uh, extra callback on the on a particular console, at that moment we just can have an, uh, a command line option switch force atomic writes on the console. Which then right. forces it only on those which have them and ignores all others, but then it's a it's a it's a core infrastructure property and and you gain support once the the particular drivers gain support. Doing it the other way around, is, I think, is wrong. Sure. So you get it for free, almost. All right, thanks guys for the feedback. Nice job, John. Yeah, so far we, we have been having a nice discussion. It's really nice to see how productive it's being the, this microconference. And uh, now, yeah, now, now we're going to get a roadmap, right? Yeah, now we, we get the, the fabulous, fabulous Question uh, and answer from Thomas Glaxo, and he presented the roadmap. So, uh, uh, the, the idea of this last slot is to make questions, hard questions to Thomas Glaxo and see what he can up. So, do we have any questions about the parameter key to Thomas? It's your chance. So wait, preemptrt is in the main line now, but does any architecture enable it? No, because we, it's not completely in the main line. We have big, big chunks of it. The, we have still a couple of things to fix and get in, uh, get merged, including Prinke. We should probably push that patch for um, compile test, though. Yeah, I I have it in the in the in the pipeline of patches I'm going to send once this conferencing crap allows me. Fair enough. So we made good progress in the in this merge window, but we're not done yet. We got two big chunks in. MM. Those are two scary, hey. scary changes. I was thinking if we should have at least one arc enable preempt RT. I'm thinking maybe user mode Linux. Oh God, we never tried that. <laughs> so, but so the thing is, running, running real time as a, a demo. Is that right, like Scotty? Stephen, it won't work. I mean, I mean there are essential pieces still, still. Uh, oh. Still missing, so it, it, it will colorfully explode. 
So what, what Peter and I were talking about is making it easier for actually compiling the, the, the RT artifacts on, on mainline. I have a patch which enables that um, for uh, x86 by, by, by just uh, uh, adding the select uh, or no, no, actually not only for x86 in general by uh, saying if Arch, support, Arch supports or uh, test compiler, whatever the, the config option is. I mean, if, if somebody compiles that thing and then boots the kernel, it's his problem, and I don't care. But it allows at least compile testing. There but was an explicit that, bug in that patch. So if you try to boot it, you, you die instantly. Yeah, and no, not instantly. It dies. Uh, one software queues or 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 used, there it dies. Well, Definitely. or maybe what you should do is just make it so it never goes to user space. The, you know, boots all the way up to. It reach user space. It panics. Right. So basically, have it just if you enable this, not it could boot all the so you could test the boot process of it, all the way up to the point where it's where it would call init instead of calling init, it just. No, you can't. Panic. Okay. I mean, it either lock. It, it will panic because I have panic in there, an explicit and early on. Uh, and other other than that, it will just lock up. Or if you have uh, uh, debug options, some debug options enabled, you're going to be drowned in 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 debug messages. So no, uh, no, it's. It, it's not going to work. I mean, we have to get the other pieces in. It's not that big anymore. It's to the essentials we have to bring in. It's about um, 100 patches and it's 2,000 lines added and and then uh, 1,000 lines deleted or something like that. So it's it's rather tiny now. Okay, so can I ask a question? I mean, I know print K is an issue, but among the other things outside of print K, um, if you were to say if you were to allow it to boot, is it just the fact that we have places where it's going to crash normally, or is it, or am I close those other places that we need to fix up, or is it just the fact that we could have unbounded um, latency? No, it's probably just going. Uh, I haven't tried, but. I expect it to just spectacularly deadlock somewhere. Okay. So it's, it, uh, I have tried because I couldn't be bothered to, but uh, shouldn't be. You could be. Can you can figure it out what happens. Yeah. I guess all you have to do is just add the one line in the architecture that it supports it and try booting it and see what happens. Right. But you can keep the pieces. Yep. I mean, if you modified the kernel, it's your fault. Yep. Well, that'd be interesting to try it. So what's, what's your you plan for the next merge window, Thomas? No, I know you got some print case stuff and I, Seem to recall seeing that you were fiddling with uh, file system namespaces. Yes, uh, yeah. That's that's my main headache at the moment. I mean, we have the the CPU chill hack still here, but uh, oh, yeah. it's it's not really pretty. Uh, on the other hand, the KVM people actually say, "Oh, we want to have CPU chill in, instead of CPU relax." Because one of the things with the trilog loops is where we have a CPU to relax in there. If one of the, if the vCPU which is holding the lock is actually scheduled out, then you spend the whole time slice in order to do trilog CPU relax, trilog CPU relax. Yeah. yeah, it's not pretty either. So yeah. Uh, but that the namespace uh, file system namespace stuff is pretty mm, interesting. Let me phrase it that way. It's, it's really hard to understand what's going on there. So I don't know whether we 
but but that's that's at the moment the least of my worries. We have a couple of things to fix up in um, uh, in MM still, but that's not big pieces. Um, but we need a better solutions than we have now, and we have a couple of uh, smaller networking issues. It's nothing big. It's just, uh, I mean, some of the changes you really want to sell proper. And uh, at times I sit there and have a five liner change and then uh, spend uh, half a day writing a change log in order to make it palat palatable for the, for the respective maintainers. And that's, that's, that's the main thing now because, uh, uh, yeah, you know, you change five lines in this so important performance sensitive code um, and then you argue for half a day whether this is actually costing you half a CPU cycle or not because it's so carefully thought out or not I mean that's reality it's been that forever Is it mostly subsystem fix-ups that you guys are subsystem and driver fix-ups? That's uh, it's a big concern now. So yeah, it's MM, it's FS. Uh, no, yeah, FS is only. Uh, yeah, we we still have to sell the decache changes, but I think they they should be not a big point of discussion because they we can abstract them completely away. Linus will hate them, but we he will accept them. I think. Um, as long as they don't or really restricted to uh, to preempt RT, because what we do there is basically uh, change the wake queue to an S weight queue, which is suboptimal, but it actually works. Um, the other things is networking, where I uh, really have to 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 look at how we sell that to the network people. Ideally, if you find an issue with their current implementation, which is not that easy in all cases, um, the rest is small adjustments here and there, left and right. Um, a couple of things have been merged already in, in, in the various sub, sub maintenance, uh, maintenance trees. Um, yeah, it's, we're, we're walking through it. And uh, I mean, then we have to have this. Um, or see you uh, problem lurking what Valentin find out, found out. And I looked at the patches we had, they were broken. Um, and then I looked at the latest version and figured out, uh, no, this doesn't look right. So actually I, I decoded what, what can be done without introducing something. Um, and no, 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 Mark. He shouldn't post the trace back. This is oh, going yeah. to be. This <laughs> takes us until tomorrow and, and, until he's done. Um, no, um, so it's it's just the small bits and pieces which are which need to be addressed right now in the right way. It's, yeah. But I don't think, except for technically, we have print pay, which is a big pile and uh, we have uh, file system namespace which is mind-boggling but in that it's mostly just spend an awful lot of time staring at it whether there might be a more elegant solution and if not come up with a reasonable change log in order to convince the intended to take it. Yeah. Any other questions? What's that? I do have a question. If it is, not, it's not exactly preempt RT, but soft RQ's latencies are an issue even without using preempt RT. I'm just wondering if any of the work done would benefit systems that don't use preempt RT. Yeah. 
I know that the problem is like in Android, there are audio glitches because of soft IQs and it's working one yeah, part. I mean, soft IQs are a permanent cause of trouble. Yeah, so Peter, this is just a solution which I'm trying to work with Google on, but I just wondering, like I thought in my head, the nicest way is threaded RQs, which I think they are print RT protected by print RT only. Uh, but generally, I think the improvements for these latencies could benefit users outside of MTRT, and that's my main question. Yeah, but but that's hard to achieve outside of a preMTRT kernel because we radically change change the uh, the preemptibility of the of the of the kernel uh, in favor of 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 real time workouts, uh, which is. The opposite of what the performance people want to do actually hawk the CPU as much as they can. So there's it's the trade-off. Okay. It's the trade-off between deterministic behavior and, and and throughput. And the other people care about throughput versus the trade-off of being not as deterministic. But there are definitely areas where those overlap or collide so there might be uh, some interesting outcome in the future so uh, we saw um, interesting developments in in, in in networking recently where people are, are moving to task driven um, uh, networking uh, which is less uh, um, Horrible and soft IRQs, and they have uh, have some good ex uh, good uh, results with that. So this will take a time because the, the the network stack is fundamentally based on on the on the soft IRQ, IRQ assumption today. That might change over time, but that's going to take a long time. So is that the threaded nappy stuff you're talking about? It's yeah. Because now they, they instead of one 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 software queue, they want to have it basically k threads, and they could run in multiple CPUs to process all these interrupts. I think. Right. Yes, and one of their goals is actually to eliminate most of the software queue disable areas in in those processing threads. Okay. So that's so, that the. So these threads actually get back under cellular control, which is the main problem of, of software queues uh, today. Right. So what's uh, Peter suggesting? Software queues interrupts or context stealing in a, in a minority kernel. So they run in the context of the, the currently interrupted task, and then they just take as much time as they want. We have some heuristic limits into it. Where we, if the the software queue processing takes too long, we just schedule a case of our QD uh, for the next round, which works or not. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, so, but this makes it this removes it all from scheduler control, and that's actually turns out to be bad even on, on non-RT workloads because you, you really want to have more stuff controlled by the scheduler and not by um, the preference of some programmer. Yeah, so the, the limit is useful, but if you have one software queue that's taking too long, the current yeah. limit, even when you try to improve it, there is no way. I mean, it has to return for you to be able to... Uh, it's, it's, it's an endless pit, so that's that's just everything people do to improve the situation is just band-aid. It, it can fix all the all the uh, things. So, so the, the only real solution is to move work out of software queued context, get rid of uh, the the software queue uh, disabling limitations, which means. Pre, which includes preempt disable on an RT kernel, and then then you actually give control back to the scheduler, which can do useful things or decide to run something else if if, if it's necessary. 
So there's a question on the on the chat. Is there an appetite for restoring case of the IQD? Um, yes. Uh, no. Uh, yes. <laughs> Actually, no. That's a K top K timer softy, not IRQD. Yeah, um, yes. Um, we we surely uh, could bring that back, but uh, the the, the problem is right now we have to concentrate on getting the actual, the current stuff upstream and then work from here and re, uh, op, bring back optimizations over time. Um, I mean, I'm happy to, to carry a, a patch which or, or patches which fit on top of the RT series, but my bandwidth actually at the moment is, is too limited to even think about it. I mean, it's not not really a bandwidth uh, limitation. It's also a budget limitation, which limits the bandwidth. Any other? Don't be shy. Oh, that's a real Looks like Masami's, Masami's writing something, I guess. Okay, that takes a long time. He gave up. <coughs> oh, no. Mark is typing. I guess if everybody starts typing something and just keeps and quits, we'll all be here staring at the chat. <laughs> Come on, people. We have other questions. <laughs> that wasn't an invite. Yeah, it's just a jumping over there. Yeah. Uh, so there, um, well, we need uh, for the uh, print RT is uh, in our uh, main line is uh, just enabling that. I mean, so, so we have to enable it per architecture. Yeah, so we have constraints on the architectures which are not that big anymore. So the X86 uh, related patches or I think we have four or five and it's something like 100 lines. Uh, so this is uh, not really uh, big anymore. If I go back in the, in the early days of RT history, there were a lot of uh, uh, patches affecting the architecture code, but this was mainly because we did not. Uh, a lot of things were actually uh, needlessly uh, uh, duplicated in the architectures, like timekeeping timers interrupts of systems and all these kind of things and we are slowly moving uh, or most of these things have been solved we recently did the the generic entry code stuff which we recommend for for uh, preempt or t enabled uh, architectures because then we have one place to modify and not five um, so uh, Going with these things to, to, to actually think about consolidating needlessly duplicated code uh, makes it easier. And yes, there was a related question from Mark um, whether we have to be afraid of uh, architecture codes uh, in the future, which comes in. I don't think there's much of the architecture code which is really affecting RT anymore. So I mean the low level, the low level access is in in uh, to uh, to the hardware have to be protected by either spin locks or disabling interrupts or whatever. Uh, anyway, so there's no way around that. Uh, but those accesses are usually very uh, short uh, credentials, so it's not not really. Um, 
uh, a threat to 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 over G anymore. Um, and people have be, become smarter over time, not to say lock world uh, do uh, tons of shit for five seconds and then unlock world. I mean, those times are gone. So uh, people got more sensitive to that and um, I'm not afraid of of it. I mean, if it breaks, we fix it. Hmm. So everybody's typing, nobody is asking questions. How did you, Stephen, how did you make it link? Without changes. No, oh, I just, well, I just went through, I did change it. I made a, uh, I forced the config, but it looks like I booted it, but it still fell back to preempt, I think. At least it says it's preempt. Uh, actually, can't, it can't even link when you, oh, when, you yeah. when you enable it. I was hoping to get some sort of error on there, but <clears throat> at least on the compile error. Why did it? <laughs> <laughs> Let me check the menu config again because Oh. It's, I guess it Mir. So you say when can we confidently say we can install this in a critical system? I mean, define critical. Um I don't know uh there's a huge amount of uh, RT instances uh, out there, and if you find it, if it fails, we all die. Okay, no, uh, never. I mean, it's not going. It's not going to work. I mean, you can't validate such such a complex beast. Is there any software that we trust that much? No. I mean, I mean, uh, safety safety is is a complex beast, and it's not only about software; it's also about the hardware. Um, there's a lot more constraints, and you can really construct. Even how I many uh, people have built uh, rail safety systems with. Uh, diverse systems in Avoda uh, 20 years ago, one running Linux on a power PC and the other running Windows 95 on an x86, you can make a, a safety certified system out of this. If you do it right, because it actually make the, the operating systems go into a black box, uh, which is not relevant to the, to the actual safety uh, a, a problem at hand because you have an external world which actually decides in, to put shit into a safe state, uh, which is okay in a lot of cases where you look at safety. If you think about self-driving cars, there's a small problem here. What's the safe state? It's not very really well defined with moving cars on a highway. Um, so it's really a complex um, it's really a complex problem. And I don't know what the people do in, in um, who actually use Linux for rocket control, how much safety net they have. I don't know. But a rocket might have hopefully stay in safe state as well, make it explode. 
I'm not convinced they use it for actually that purpose. Maybe they use it to process images and this kind of stuff, Linux, but to use it as well. No, I, I think they, I I think they still use Arcos. SpaceX has it in the rocket control. In the rocket control. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you, it, it's just a, it's just a matter how you design it. If you if you have if you have a properly designed redundant system, it's not a, it's not a big deal. I mean, you, I you, think you, it's not critically safe this one because I thought at least for medical you will need to pass cert certain certification. Maybe the rocket doesn't need to pass. No, actually you can. I mean, you, you really can get some full certification if you do it right with with just Windows 95 and and a, a box standard to to Linux uh, uh, to to something Linux kernel. It's fun, but you have to do it in the right way, and you have to the the right uh, 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 voting and decision mechanisms around around those thingies, which actually have to be certifiable, and that's 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 a very very common approach, uh, because the less complex the actual decision making and the safety relevant part or the more freedom you have on the other side. That's really application dependent. As I said, there's a way easier decision to make what's the safe state of a train than what's the safe state of a car moving at 100 kilometers per hour on a highway together with 500 under 500 other cars and trucks and whatever so that's uh, just a matter of complexity and, and uh, so if you have a well-defined safe state your decision logic can logic can be very very small and easy to certify and it can circumvent all the stupid uh, certification for the os completely because you can look at it as a black box which has an output They don't have to certify the code itself. No, no. You have to you have to certify the decision logic, which says two out of uh, depending on your complexity, uh, two out of two, uh, two out of three, three out of four agree, and that's okay. If they don't agree, I have this knob which puts it into a safe state. That's fine as long as yeah. uh, as long as you have a well-defined safe state. It, there will be a talk about this tomorrow, actually, where Gabriel yeah. Polon and I talk about the approach that we are thinking it would be good for Linux, because there are some ISO rules that that say we could use some software uh, testing it as a black box, but. It seems that for the automotive case, Linux is too complex to be tested on that regard. And uh, there, there are some some discussions about it in the Lisa front. And tomorrow, actually, we'll have a, a talk in the referee track where Gabriele Polone and I will, will show what we are thinking to do or what we think or what the community is a, a good direction for, for the Linux. But yes, it's it's always a balance of what you turn it all into a black box. It's entire Linux, it's part of Linux and test integrations. But it, it's very dependent on the the system you aim to certify. And cars are, are more complex than the system like probably more complex than system like rockets or or, or or trains where you have a more controlled environment. But yeah, this is an open, open issue for, for the entire community. And, um, Glenn, uh, community blast RT dash config template. <laughs> uh, what's your action? Uh, it's also very, very 
different uh, uh, application dependent what you want to, to have and what features you need and what features you want to avoid. It depends on what, what latency requirements. So real time is really it's a design problem. It's not not necessarily a con yes. It becomes a configuration problem at the end. But in the in the, in the first place, it's a design problem because you have to understand what you're trying to achieve. And then you have to have to define your constraints and group here. So by real time control loop, which has to have a period of one second and has a, a maximum latency of let's say 100 milliseconds, is still real time if the outcome is critical. Uh, so, but it's way, a very relaxed environment that somebody who is who, who is trying to do a one kilohertz control loop on something there is no real i mean there, there can be recommendations on what might cause latencies if you really go for um for the the, the two digit uh, microseconds latency range uh, but but there's no no real uh, recipe for that because it's real time system have to be designed from ground up. Like safety, you can say, okay, I, th I throw a safety OS at my problem and everything is safe. It doesn't work. For security, you have to design security. I mean, it's a little, falls all in the same ballpark. And our problems get more complex time. So there's there should be way more uh, time spent on, on design than on. And then, if you have a design and have the requirements well defined, then usually the configuration will fall out of it. Um, Thomas, sorry, uh, I asked it on chat. Uh, are, are, are you thinking about some uh, documentation or some sort of help? Uh, to kernel developers to uh, to feel more uh, at ease in this world of Linux kernel development uh, with RT in mind, because uh, we have lots of caveats, uh, caveats sorry, with uh, um, contexts and uh, taking locks, uh, locks in sleeping contexts and all that stuff. So uh, are you guys thinking about something to, to help people uh, to... I mean, I wrote, we wrote quite some extensive documentation on the locking constraints explain the differences between RT and, and non-RT um, and yes we we should expand on the documentation uh, so help is welcome patches uh, thank you yes uh, I was asking that because uh, the current documentation is is really interesting the lock types and uh, the Lock, lock in, in a preemptive uh, context, but uh, maybe something else. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, unfortunately, our time is up. And we should close the bar. Uh, anyway, it uh, it seems that it was the most productive uh, microconference we had in the last last years, at least in the real time uh, realm. And uh, I, I would like to say thanks to everybody who participated and engaged in discussions. I remember having some nice feedback for people that participated, like for the first time. And it seems that we have a, a real community around here. And uh, yeah, thank you all. Mark, any more? Thanks. Thanks for running it, Daniel. I think you did a really good job. Thank you. My pleasure. And that's it. We love you all and see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye. And Daniel, you could save the notes. I already did too. But I gotta go through and save okay. them for all the MCs this time since we forgot to yes. do that last time. <laughs> yes, I, I already saved the copy as well. And thank you for everybody who took notes. It's, it's very hard. And yeah, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Don't end the meeting.
Yeah. And you got the notes? Yes. How can you copy paste it or is it like a way to download it probably? I, I copy paste it. You click, no, you could, okay, if you're in the uh, shared notes, you see the two arrows up on top? Ah. Click on that, and you can export it as HTML, plain text, Microsoft Word, PDF, or even um, ODF. So we want it as Microsoft Word? Yeah, you could do that. I did it in plain text, HTML, and PDF. Where, where is the RST option? Where well, you, know, you can, you can <laughs> yeah, the LaTeX option, that'd probably be better. And there's Etherpad, I don't even know what format that is. <sighs> and it has a really mm -hmm. nice name. Is that like just a git commit ID? The what? The name of oh, the file. Is that just the git commit ID? No, I don't think it's a git commit. I just think it's just some hash that they use. Okay, so have fun. I'm going to go and go through and this time save the notes on all the MCs in case anyone forgets, like, you know, <laughs> happened yesterday. Like on the schedule of the conference. No, we yes, don't accept that publicly. <laughs> <laughs> that happens. That happens. So bye bye. I'm really tired. Bye bye.